Good morning, and welcome to this edition of At The Mic. I'm your host, Keith Malinak. I hope you are having a lovely Saturday wherever you are uh, tuned in and watching us here today. Uh, it's actually very windy in the 30s here in North Texas, uh, but in about 92 hours from now, we're going to be well into the 80s. Uh, on Wednesday, that that is uh, that's uh, interesting, and I'm sure you have uh, uh, interesting weather where you are as well, because winter is still here. So, uh, part seven of our twelve part saving Disney history, um, really a um, college level course, if you ask me. College, you should ask for history credit uh, after watching this. It's going to end up being twenty four hours with Professor Ed. Uh, a couple hours each time, 12-part series. Take us through March 23rd, I believe, is the last day of this. So if you've missed anything, check the Disney playlist here on the At The Mic YouTube channel and catch up. Uh, and they're all self-contained with different uh, subject matter on all of them. And without further ado, let me get my buddy here, <laughs> Professor Ed McCray. I, I don't care if you're technically a professor or not. Uh, you are for us, sir. And uh, we appreciate uh, you making time and and sharing your incredible knowledge man it's just so deep um but however i believe rob borowski my partner in crime here for this youtube channel i don't know when or if you want to mix this in but he sent us a fun fact about the uh, walt that uh that i found fascinating so i don't know i you, oh we you can take we can talk about that because i didn't know about that that yeah. uh it's not the opening anymore. They've changed it. But it, when Lasseter was there, they had an opening where the castle was all realistic and everything. And it has the river where he proposed to his wife and got married on the. I didn't know that. That's I knew that his river. Yeah. yeah, I knew that family crest was his up on the castle, but I didn't we'll know that about the river. That. Let's do. Yeah. Let's do a picture of that in one of these episodes so yeah. that you can walk us through that information. But okay, so take it away. Today's uh, topic, I believe, is Disney Legends. Correct. Yeah, most of these ones today are in the, in the animation studio, but we're going to get the nine old men in there and all that. Uh, I had one thing I forgot to mention last week about the gremlins. When they moved Walt's uh, office after he died, back in the 60s he died, and in the 70s they moved the office out, they found two things in his bottom drawer. One was the script from Steamboat Willie, and the other was one of those gremlins dolls that we had the picture of uh, last oh. time. So he That's... had one in his desk all that time, and that was in my notes, but I didn't. I forgot to mention that last week. That's really wild. Okay. Yeah. Cool, man. And the, the other thing we got here, uh, we're Jimmy Dodd there. We have talked about an episode two with the Mickey Mouse Club. Somebody sent this, uh, emailed this pit photo in. This photo was uh, given out when you wrote to the studio for a photo, and it says there, "God bless the Mickey Mouse Club." And it looks oh. like a, a a youth group picture or a Sunday school picture. It doesn't look like you know, a Disney photo, but that would, that was an official publicity photo that they would send out. He's a Disney legend too, but uh, that's why I worked it in there. And then uh, the next one there, I got this off of eBay. It's an article where he talks about his faith. And uh, oh, wow. Okay. I mean, that's, that's part of the story. Why you can't see the Mickey Mouse club today. Hang on a second. For some reason it's opening up a different picture here. There we go. Hang on. I'm going to get this up there. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So what year do you think this is? Uh... I th It's got to be 50, uh, somewhere between 55 and 57. Hmm. And I don't know what the publication was, but uh, on the other side of that is uh, Bob Cummings. And he was one of the hosts of when Disneyland opened. He had his own TV show as well. But uh, that, that another piece of Disney history on the other side. Wow. And he goes That's through that whole thing about his organization he had where they, they did ministry in Hollywood. And he says Hollywood needs to be saved. And this was in the 50s he said this. Oh, wow. So, and uh, with Disney Legends, we have a trophy here. There's an, actually a formal award called the Disney Legend. Wow. How, how do you how do you qualify for that? Well, Rich, this is what we're <laughs> this is what's funny about it. Originally. They were given away for people in, who contributed in uh, the studio history. And now it's a political award because now uh, the, the cast of The View all got one. Oh, get out of and, my face. And then uh, <laughs> I, I just brought all these franchises up. So George Lucas got one and Stan Lee and uh, the cast of Star Wars. But they're not really Disney history. They just Disney bought the, you know, the franchise. So, and 
it should just go for people who've contributed. Like many of the artists that were there in the 90s making Aladdin, Beauty and the Beast, Lion King and all that. They're not Disney legends and they should be. And wow. uh, so it's pretty much meaningless. But the people we're talking about today, they're the genuine Disney legends, some of them. And uh, mm -hmm. we, we'll start with the animation studio. And I'll tell you a little bit about the <clears> studio. <throat> this this was the original studio that he uh, it, he kind of built it as he went. Uh, and this is where the Silly Symphonies, Mickey Mouse cartoons, Donald and Goofy and all that, and Snow White were made. I'm having and, trouble uh, on this end. You keep talking. Don't worry oh, about just, me. Okay. When uh, Walt eventually, with after the films came out, like Bambi, that when Walt would come to the studio, they would say, man's in the forest, so everyone would behave and all that. And if he was grumpy, they would the guard at the gate would say he had a bear suit on, and he might uh -huh. yell at people and stuff. So and would he call ahead from the gate, the, the security the guard, guard? The guard would, yeah. <laughs> and that, that's when he, he entered the floor. He had a smoker's cough. And, you know, we can't know that he smoked now. Oh, but, oh uh, yeah. <laughs> we have photos of him smoking today. <laughs> and oh. uh, But they, they would be on their best behavior if they knew man was in the forest. If he had the bear suit on, they all dreaded he'd yell at them. If he was in a happy mood, they called him Mickey Yellow Shoes or Mickey Old Shoes. Wow, that's a lot to remember, man. Yeah. Well, they <laughs> had all these codes and everything. Uh huh. You know, everywhere you work, the employees have things like that. Yeah, that's funny. Not, no, not where I work. No, we never do this stuff like that. Are you kidding me? That's awesome, <laughs> man. I love that. Uh, that's a cool, uh, cool little setup there too. So that's in California, right? Yeah, that's in California. Mm -hmm. That one's tore down. I think it's a grocery store now where that studio was. Oh wow, that's a shame. I, I yeah. wonder if there's. Do they preserve it at least? Maybe. Have a plaque in the uh, produce aisle or something. I don't know, if there's, don't know huh? if there's a plaque there, but the storefront that uh, he he was in originally, where he made the Silent Alice comedies and all that, they have a plaque there. It's a it's a FedEx or Kinkos or something now, <laughs> and uh, they have a plaque there with little pictures and everything. There's some of the staff there, um, cool. and uh, a lot of these people uh, came into animation with Walt at the beginning. And uh, as he, his, co his company grew, he'd move the animation people into other parts of the studio like Disneyland and television and film and all that. But a lot of them started here at this time in the animation studio. And uh, how a lot big of was, were the uh, the grounds there? How big was the, the whole I think setup? it was I think it was 20 acres for that one, but I'm not positive. I think the one they moved into after Alice in Wonderland was uh, 70. Mm. And they, they took some of the buildings out of that studio with them. They were like little bungalows and stuff. And they, they made one a guard gate or something. Uh, I'm not an expert on all that offhand. Uh, and okay. uh, a lot of people comment, he never praised his staff, but I think part of that was because uh, he, when he got betrayed on the Oswald thing, a lot of those guys started Looney Tunes and the MGM's animation department, all that. They were like, they became competitors and he mm. praised them back then. So I think that's why he didn't do that. As he went on, he'd praise other people about your work, but he wouldn't praise you to your face very often. <laughs> and that's when they knew he was going to die because he was telling them they did good work, and they he never said that before. Oh man, and he he was about a decade older than most of the other. There he is smoking there, <laughs> and and uh, a lot of them smoked there. And he did the radio too because he was the voice of Mickey Mouse. I don't know if we'd mentioned that. And uh, Mickey Mouse had a radio show. So he also did the voice of Mickey Mouse on the radio. And that's right. his office there. <clears throat> well, it seems kind of, I don't know, sterile. <laughs> it, well, that's when they first moved in. It got more cluttered okay. as it okay. went. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Because that, that would have probably been around the time of Fantasia. So that would have been the other studio. But because uh, the, the little statues are, are from Fantasia on his desk. Gotcha. All right. And a lot of the frat boy <clears throat> stuff went on at the studio that... Uh, some of the things uh, they couldn't do in front of Walt, but sometimes Walt would dish it out and uh, no one could do anything to retaliate because he's the boss. <laughs> okay. You know, and, and they knew not to mention any sexual humor around Walt because he felt that was a private matter and he did, they didn't want to offend him because he would go off on them if he caught them with that. Yeah. And uh, some of the jokes that Walt played, one of his PR guys was a staunch Democrat, so Walt would send him to Republican events because he thought it was funny. <laughs> when he couldn't go and uh sometimes they when one time he walked to a room and they had a drawing of walt on the bulletin board where he was dressed as a devil and they all were freaking out that walt might see it and uh he pretended he didn't see it and then he 
they all were relieved. And then he peeked his head in after he left. And he said, who's that handsome devil on the wall? And uh, <laughs> oh, really? every animation rule and convention and everything was either refined or originated at the Disney studio. Uh, they were the, the only studio that even had a guy on staff where they would make alternate artwork uh, with the words on it for foreign markets, like in other languages. Yeah. And that, that that's all that's done today. But back then, that, that really wasn't done. That was just a Disney thing, huh? Okay. Well, at the time, especially with the animation, because this was really like the A-list animation studio. And he only got an animation because he uh, couldn't get into live action. He wanted to get in live action in the beginning. He thought it was too late to get an animation. But a lot of these people that came to work for him, they all came out of the Midwest. And before that, the only animation studios were in New York City. So you had urban people there. But you think about Midwestern values and all that. That's why they're all at Disney. He, that similar values came there right right so i've got a question because we hadn't mentioned walt being the voice of mickey did that last until walt's death or did he relinquish he, that at some point he, he retired from it semi-retired from it from the in the mid 1940s because it got hard for him to do the voice with the smoker's voice <laughs> But if you hear the the openings of the Mickey Mouse Club that Mickey was animated, he does the voices for that. And that clip we showed last week, where that's the uh, Wizard of Oz thing at the the Mickey Mouse Club, mm. he he's the voice of Mickey there. You can tell it's him. And I think that's the latest I've ever heard him do the voice, and that's 1957. Okay. But huh. uh, one of the people we didn't get to this week, we'll get to some point. He took over Jimmy McDonald. He was the sound effects guy at Disney, and. Walt was too busy, he didn't want to keep doing the voice of Mickey, and he told him to do it. And that's who was Mickey until the 80s. This hey, Jimmy right. McDonald guy. The official voice. Now they're wow. on Mickey number four. Okay. <laughs> All right. Very interesting. All always, right. He always strove for excellence with his studio and everything, and that kind of annoyed some of the artists. And one of them asked him why he didn't just walk on water, and Walt said, I've tried it, it doesn't work. Okay. All right. So now we go to our first folder about our first legend. We've mentioned him a little bit before, but this one's of iWorks. He, he started with Walt in uh, Kansas City. And in his his story was his father abandoned the family when he was a child. They never talked about the father and the family. Uh, he's the uh, he partnered with Roy and Walt on the Disney. He you know it, was, it went uh, three ways at the beginning, and he's really the Nikola Tesla of animation. He co he co-created Oswald, Mickey Mouse, single-handedly animated several of the first Mickey Mouse shorts and silly symphonies. And uh Walt would play practical jokes on him, and Ub didn't like it, and they eventually had their falling out. All <laughs> from a practical joke. Well, well, well the, the we mentioned it before what the falling out was. They were at a party, and Walt said, You draw the Mickey and I'll sign my name just like we always do, and that set him off. Oh. But there was another time where the, before that, where uh, Ub was interested in a girl that worked at the studio, and Walt put him up on a blind date, and then he uh, hid in the plants at the restaurant and filmed it and showed the animators. That you know, it's kind of mean. Uh. A, lot, a lot of people uh, thought Ub was the success behind Disney, and uh, Ub so didn't want any part of it when he left. He sold out his share; it would have been worth billions today. Oh but my he, goodness! He started his own studio, and his main character was Flip the Frog. Flip the Frog. And uh, these shorts of Ubs, they're on DVD, and I think they're they're moving them onto Blu-ray. They're all public domain now. But uh, and there's all the animating there. And uh, Flip never really caught on like Mickey, but you can see how they were using the Mickey template on some of the merchandising. I was just about here. to say, I want to go back to that. Yeah, I mean, well, look there, at there's that. more coming up. More coming well, up. Okay. A lot of the characters back then looked like that. That's Up when he came back. And, oh. And that's him in the '60s there at the bottom. Oh, so they so they made up he, then? Or? He came back. I'm gonna get to it, but he, oh, he my came bad. back. No, Shoot, it's okay. I'm, I'm I'm all out of order here, aren't I? Well, no, you're I'm fine. I put little... all the I put all the photos at the beginning, so you can okay. see how they kind of. That's true with all these people we're gonna talk about. Should I be looking for uh, uh, flip oh, the frog oh, you, pictures? You can, you can just keep going as okay. whatever space you want. Uh, a lot of the a lot of the animation uh, characters at that time they all looked alike, and some people claim it's because of uh, in vaudeville they had the black face, and that's why they're all. They all look like that. But oh, Floyd Norman says that's not so. Wow. What do we got going on here? That's a, a caricature of Ub. <laughs> a lot of the animators would draw themselves. In. This is from the Mickey shorts. Okay. That's the one where he, that's the very first one animated, playing crazy. That's where he would snap Minnie's underwear. 
All right. That's from Steamboat uh, Willie. That was actually is. that was the third one animated. Have you made your own Steamboat Willie cartoon now that uh, the I see someone's making a a, a no. murder one now where oh, like they did bro. someone did Winnie the Pooh and now yeah. they're doing that. And I think they did Bambi. I've also drew the Mickey Mouse comic strip. That's what that's from. And that was mm -hmm. an adaptation of Playing Crazy. Hmm. That's see, a cool that was, name, Ub. Well, his real name was, I can't say it, but it, and then when he went by Ub, it was E-U-B-B-E. -E. Mm. And Walt, Walt always put his name on the poster because he thought people would look at it more than once because it was such an unusual name. Yeah, he's right. I was trying to figure out the, the folder that, what, like, what did he title this folder? Yeah, oh, look at there. That's a cool mm -hmm. picture there. Well, some people even thought that Up Iwerks was an alias for Walt. I've seen that in trivia questions, and it's not. Oh wow! And uh, that's because he his name it was such an unusual name. Yeah, it almost looks like something spelled backwards. You know, it's like mm -hmm. what is it? What is well, like a code? Walt did that too on some of his films when he was more involved. He called it his name Yen Sid, and that's Disney backwards. Uh huh. Wow. Good stuff here. Huh. That, wow. that one, uh, it Mickey was wearing checkered pants. I just noticed that when it went through. and Oh, that was a, quite a while back. You don't have to go back. Oh, okay, okay. But uh, I never had noticed that before. This is That's from the Skeleton Dance, and that's the first Silly Symphony. You can just keep going there. Okay. Because Ub animated that almost by himself. He was training Les Clark, who was, became one of the nine old men. He did one of the scenes in it, but uh, that was the very first Silly Symphony. You know, you think about Disney, you don't think of macabre stuff like that. Yeah, I didn't like this. I know exactly this cartoon. Don't care for it. Flip that's the Ub's, frog. That's Ub Studio there. Now, Ch Chuck Jones started with Ub Iwerks. He, he washed the cells. Hmm. And some of the other characters he did there, he did a little fat kid named Willie Whopper. <laughs> and then there was uh, every studio had a of their own version of the silly symphonies where, where they would have a fairy tale or story with music and ubs was called the comma colors and a lot of those are on those public domain videos and dvds that they had when we were growing up i mean it, it, you can see the influence like how it's the mickey eyes and well even mickey, mickey's kind of based on <clears throat> felix the cat because felix the cat's similar right that, that was how people drew back then uh -huh. and but only Ub would sit there and go through a whole thing. Now, that one, I think, was a Mickey joke. Huh. That's in Flip the Frog, but he has the mouse with the violin. And that short there, that one, uh, the guy playing the violin, after they give him their last penny, he gets out and he has both legs and he goes into a limousine and leaves. <laughs> and that was during the Great Depression. Mm. That's some of the merchandise for Flip the Frog. Oh my gosh, how much is that worth, man? I don't know. I don't have any of it. I'd kind of like a uh, Flip the Frog figure. No kidding. Just from the history of it. Yeah. Wow. Because he was only around for a couple <clears throat> of years. He he didn't catch on. Hmm. Ub Studio was only around for about nine to ten years. There's Willy Whopper. Yeah. What's up, buddy? Yeah. He's, he's uh, what, what, what does Jeffy call fat phobic or? <laughs> oh, uh, uh... Fat shaming or yeah, you know, he would not uh, be popular today. Yeah. Uh-huh. Wow. And the eyes, I mean, those were I mean, look at well, that. That was I mean, that was the style the back style. then. Yeah. They, they were yeah. called uh, pie cut eyes. Oh, uh, pie cut, yep. Now Walt could only do technicolor. I, I guess that one was smaller than I thought. Walt could only do technicolor, he had to deal with it, so everybody else could only use two strip color. So until, until the contract with Walt was up. And uh, that's all these studios had their own little shorts like that. They're, Mary Melody started out as a thing of Silly Symphonies. R rip off of Silly Symphonies. And there was uh, the Jolly Frolics and just all, all kinds. Of, every studio had their own. But that's like how Walt changed the industry with what he was doing. Even though those studios have been around, some of them, like the Fleischers, they'd been around uh, for a decade before Walt came along. And everybody... In Ub's cartoons are very strange too. There's one of them we're going to link to that's uh, it's Balloon Land where these everyone's a balloon and the the characters and they <laughs> run from the pincushion man. Oh God! And, I mean, it's not they're 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 <laughs> and even Ub was doing skeletons there. Yeah. Look at that guy. 
when now when the up studio went under he uh what had a mutual friend and he up expressed he wanted to come back to work with walt the friend set up a dinner with walt and they agreed he'd come back and up would only report to walt and up was told he could work wherever he wanted to and one of the things he did was he worked on the moly plane camera it had been built for snow white but up perfected it and uh he just would do all of these inventions with the camera department and everything and when Walt got into live action, a lot of the special effects Walt's known for, a by works created. That's a camera that went 360 degrees, and they would project it like that. Uh, that would come around in the 50s and 60s, and they'd play it at Disneyland. Oh, my gosh. And I guess some of them, they would do tour videos, because I found some of that. Uh, they had a traveling screen. And that was like the first IMAX. Up also worked for Alfred Hitchcock. Walt loaned him out to work on the birds. <laughs> special effects. And... Oh. Uh, he up was a perfectionist just like Walt, but like when he mastered something, he'd give up on it like he did archery and bowling and animation when he f figured he did all that could be done. He no longer was interested. I recognize and those faces. That's from the pirates. He also worked on the the rides in Disneyland. He did some of the lighting effects. The first time anyone ever had a candleless flame was on Pirates of the Caribbean. Wow. And I'll figure that out. And so when you go out for Halloween in the stores, they have the projection lights. Now you can get for like 10 bucks that project things on your house. Uh -huh. That's similar to technology he invented. Wow. How cool is that, and man? He, uh, pe some people thought that, uh, Ub was resentful of Walt. They still didn't like each other. But when Walt came, when Ub came back, it was during the strike. And it really meant a lot to Walt that Ub was crossing the picket lines to come back to the studio Oh, wow. Walt had been betrayed all those times by different people. And here, Up was a, he had betrayed Walt, but then he came back and uh, he was, uh, when Walt had people in that were going to tour the studio and he couldn't spend time to do that, he had Up take them around. So, I mean, he was, he was very, he was trusted like a brother. And uh, some of the things he, he perfected was uh, he had, uh, the live action reference they would do for animation. He set that up. No one had done that. Like he did it uh, before optical printing, where they do the special effects on the, on the, the film. And, like George Lucas started out with that, but Ub is the one that really perfected that. He figured out how to do traveling mats, do things like uh, with Haley Mills. They made her the twins. That was right. That was a big deal back then. Right. I mean, so... yeah. And it, and this was just a, when he had his own studio, I was making things like that with his, with parts from cars and in the junkyard and stuff. He was inventing things and Walt just gave him whatever he wanted for money. Cause he knew it would make the films better. And uh, cool. when, when they couldn't afford to ink the cells anymore, I figured out how to Xerox the animator line and onto the cells and that the animators like that. Cause they always complained that the ink and paint people weren't uh, translating their lines well enough. And uh, even with uh, a film like Darby O'Gill and the little people, he figured out how to have the camera pan with forced perspective. And I mean, that, that's a film coming up here cause it's March. Got to watch it with for the leprechauns. And <laughs> what was the first person that made leprechauns into likable characters? Oh wow, that's interesting. Yeah, but that all I think went back to the Gremlins. I think that he that he everything he learned that they couldn't do in the Gremlins. I think that's why he did what he did with the Leprechauns, and I'm the only person that's ever made that connection, as far as I know. That's really but, cool. Uh, but in up up stayed there until the 70s, and then he passed away. But he won Oscars and all kinds of awards for his efforts and everything. In our next folder, we have uh, K. Kamen. And uh, he was a licensing legend. He li licensed the Little Rascals. All right. I love that show, man. Used to well, be on TBS early in the mornings. Well, now it's probably offensive. They probably say it's racist or something. Oh, yeah. Okay. It was just kids being kids. I and, know. And... Gosh. And boy, the way those kids all died tragically. Oh, I know. Yeah. Oh, God. And the only like Alfalfa. The guy that the guy that was Alpha Alpha, he always cameos in all the Christmas movies from back then, when he was an adult. That's K. K. Man. He was also from Kansas City, and uh, he wanted to license Mickey Mouse. So what he did was he withdrew all of his money from the bank. He sewed it into his coat. He took a two day trip on a train to California. He stayed awake the whole time because he was afraid someone was going to steal the coat with his money in it. And when he got to the Walt Studio, he spread the money on the desk and he said that he promised him that plus fifty percent of all the revenue. And Walt was going to get into merchandising because he'd been cheated on Oswald and it would have brought money into the studio. So uh, he talked it over with Roy while uh, 
Kay came in, was in the uh, outer office, and he fell asleep because he'd been awake for two days. And uh, what Walt and Roy liked about him was he was conservative with Midwestern values. He agreed not to let the characters uh, market anything like alcohol, cigarettes, laxatives. I don't know why that was listed, <laughs> but it was. Wow. I'm, I'm, had to only I'm not, products that appealed to kids. I was going to say, okay. I'm not familiar with uh, cartoon characters, uh, famous cartoon characters on a box of X-Lax, if that's ever I, happened. I'm not either, but who knows back in the 30s. That is hysterical. But this was all new back then, character merchandising to sure. this degree. Yep. And they agreed on the quality of the merchandise. It had to be affordable to kids. That was the other thing. Uh Mickey Mouse stuff was affordable at five and dime stores so kids could buy the stuff. And it was the Great Depression, so you, you couldn't just be high end or they wouldn't be able to afford it. Right. And Kay Kamen was Jewish and Walt gave him all this uh, free reign with his characters. And people tried to say Walt was anti Semitic. Well, he trusted this guy mm -hmm. to lead his marketing. Yeah. And uh, the following year, when they set this up in the 30s, he made the came and made the deal with uh, Angersoll Waterbury, and they made watches, and they sold over a hundred million dollars of these watches by 1948. That's the famous watch. Now they're not famous, but Mickey was with the the arms would tell the time. Uh, you remember when you were a kid? Oh, oh my gosh, yes, I had the. I haven't seen one in years in a store, but they were they were still around when I was a kid. Yeah, I don't. I doubt. I. Still I don't know if they one. still make them. But he did Mickey Mouse magazines, buttons. Uh, he started the first Mickey Mouse Club that was in the 1930s. And he put the characters on food packaging. I thought that was kind of neat because that was his letterhead. That's cool. And uh, Kate came in and became a millionaire selling all the, you so, know, doing the marketing. So he was based in New York. He didn't have to live out in California at the studios well, then? He eventually moved to, Ca to New York with his office, but he had okay. he started in Kansas City. Gotcha. Okay. He, had, he did stuff overseas as well for Disney. I mean, he was in charge of the global enterprise. And uh, I got gotcha. you. He eventually he did this for 20 years and he died in a plane crash with his wife and 48 uh, other people. What year was that? Uh, I think it was 48 or 49. Oh. But he'd already set up the campaign for Cinderella. So that still stayed in. You see that those Mickey Mouse dolls are very popular. Wow. That was the highest resolution I could find that online because in the book I have, it's on the seam and I couldn't get a good uh, scanning oh. of it. Yeah, look at that, man. So he, Kay Kamen is where... M merchandising was started. The enterprise really began to and you, branch there's, out. No one really has written a book about him and you, you think about how characters are merchandised or they were, that's how it all started. Mm-hmm. He put out these magazines, and that's what these are. These are the catalogs that stores would get, and they could pick out what they wanted to buy to sell in their store. And I'm sure people collect that stuff. I mean, the magazines themselves. He, 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 he handled it right on through until he passed away, and then they uh, got somebody else. So cool. Oh, sorry, that's a small one there. That that's something he would send out that had all the different characters that were available to be merchandised. Oh wow, wow! That that would have been the early '40s because some of the characters from Bambi are on there and the films that they made for, of the South American uh, shorts and all that. Hang on, Hiawatha. The the tortoise and the hare there are, are at the bottom. They were popular silly symphony characters. Uh -huh. The grasshopper from the grasshopper and the ants. The three little pigs, people don't realize they were just as popular as the seven dwarfs. Huh. I hate how it does that. Yeah. Stupid thing pops up. Really drives me nuts. Uh, I'll be back on that. All right. Continue and I'll oh, catch up to you. Well, I just had the pictures there of the Mickey Mouse Club and all that. And I have uh, Mickey and the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade in that uh, folder. Before I go to the next guy. Oh, okay. Well, stand by. We'll get there. I mean, this is fascinating stuff. And and well, I put it in there because I thought people would find it interesting because th they don't know how characters were marketed in the 1930s. I mean, we're almost a hundred years to when when this all was, and and uh, it's it's all was a lot like it was in the 90s. I wouldn't say so much today because people don't care about the characters they're making. <laughs> 
Right, right, right. I mean, I can't even tell you that what who the last few characters are. This is from a collector. They just collected all this stuff. They put it in oh, cabinets and everything. That's smart. Oh my gosh! Wow. I mean, this these were people that were kids in the 1930s, and they collected right? all the toys. And oh. I mean, people think toy collecting is something new, and it's not. And I just wonder the, if these families that inherited this stuff understood what they had. I don't know. Gosh, I, I've seen. Uh, some on YouTube, there's some of those shows where they they do the antiques and the collectibles and all that. And there's this one guy that's a big Mickey Mouse collector, and he sold some of his stuff to that uh, Pawn Stars shop. That. I thought that was neat because it had his uh, company name on the back. Yeah. But a lot of people don't know there was a Mickey Mouse Club in the 30s, and they met in movie theaters and they watched Mickey Mouse car cartoons. And it was a lot like the Boy Scouts. They had like their own little oath and everything, like the Boy Scouts do. That's one of the membership cards I found online. Gosh. <laughs> and they're, they're, see them all wearing the Mickey Mouse mask? It's kind of creepy. creepy. But <laughs> that whole theater, all the kids yeah. are wearing those. Wow. Mickey and Minnie. Wow. And I don't think any other character had a club like that. And that's from the Macy's Parade. And I think that was 33 or 32. I'm not positive offhand. <sighs> but. Uh, Oops. I mean, and that's what they changed the route of the parade. That's when it went through uh, Times Square. Right. Man. A lot of people don't realize the history of the Macy's parade because of what it's become. But that's another story. <laughs> yeah. You said it. Are we on to Norm Ferguson here? Yeah, Nor Norm Ferguson. He was one of the first animators. He started in 1929. He was one of the first master animators. And he created Pluto. Oh, that's my that's my guy. Well, when Pluto was the first character that really uh, you could see him thinking on screen and why a lot of the nine old men came to work at Disney because of this cartoon he did with uh, Pluto stuck on flypaper. <laughs> I had to, there's a couple stills that we'll get to the, in, in that folder. Okay. And uh, in the early days of animation, what he specialized in was a motion and interaction of a scene. And that when they originally cast the animators, they, they cast by emotion. And later on in the 50s and 60s on, they, ca they cast the animators by specializing in a certain character. So this is why it was kind of hard to get photos and images of what characters they all worked on. Because in the beginning, they, they worked on a lot of the same characters. I love how he's got the mirror there, and he's basically just drawing his they, expression. That's still how they do hand-drawn animation today. I even have a mirror yeah. like that. That's why I have the beard. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Because you, you want to see on yourself how the, an expression looks. Uh-huh. And sometimes they invent expressions. When they did, uh, Danny DeVito was in Hercules. He played the little uh, satyr guy, little Pam. And uh, he did a lip shape the animator had never seen before where it's a bow tie. And so he calls it that the Danny <laughs> DeVito shape. And it's, uh, I can't do it, but Danny DeVito does it. And that's from the short with the flypaper. Okay. And. He he also animated on uh, Pete the villain, you know, the uh -huh. from the Mickey Mouse cartoons, the Big Bad Wolf, the Witch and Snow White, and Gideon and Foul Fellow in po Pinocchio. Uh, he developed many of the now established rules of animation. He animated almost twice as much material a week as most of the other animators. He worked on the character shorts, the silly symphonies, the animated features. P people called him Walt's fair-haired boy at the time. That's what he was thought of. He trained John Lousbury, who we'll get to later on, one of the nine old men. He worked very closely with uh, Lousbury, worked very closely with him. Uh, he sh uh, Ferguson shared some of his bonuses with Lousbury. Uh, Ferguson had no formal training. Uh, Walt moved him as a, up to a production supervisor. And as the nine old men surpassed these early animators, uh, he got moved into uh, directing and things like that. And... Uh, he uh, started drinking. A lot of them dealt with their inadequacies by drinking, unfortunately. And uh, he <clears throat> suffered from diabetes. And he got fired from the studio in 1953. He died of a heart attack in 57. Uh, his life revolved around Disney, and people said he died of a broken heart. <laughs> Golly. And it was hard finding information about him. A lot of these guys, it was hard to put information together about them because they're from the early days. Mm -hmm. And even some of the nine old men, it's surprising. Not all of them are famous like Ward Kimball. And Ward Kimball, you have all these eccentric, interesting stories about. And some of the nine old men, you have to 
you had to really dig to find just basic things about them. And all these pictures we're seeing here are these are all Norm Ferguson. Uh -huh. Okay. Wow. And uh, famous characters with, in here. With Gideon and, and Fallfellow, uh, Walt wanted them to base Gideon on his brother who sold uh, insurance. <laughs> and uh, Ferguson made him more like a vaudevillian uh, actor. And you watch the characters interact in Pinocchio, and and uh, you you kind of see that theatrical quality about him. And I I tried to find photos and pictures of the drawings because a lot of you guys haven't seen the drawings; you've only seen the actual cell animation. So I did a lot of digging to find that. Uh, a lot of the cell or the hand drawn images they came from from a blog of of the animator Andreas Deja. He puts it out there for people to uh, see a lot of the. Uh, old guys drawings and everything and we'll link to it at the beginning give him credit where it came from he's the only person that has this stuff out there at high resolution so we can show it wow I mean, good stuff that pinocchio cost uh, twice as much as snow white and people don't realize that it was really like it, it got six months behind we'll get into that a little bit later but uh it would have came out in 1939 if it had been on track and 1939 is considered the Best year ever in the movies. Oh, that's Gone with the Wind year. Yeah, in Snow, in uh, uh, Wizard of Oz and all that. Pinocchio came oh, out yeah. February 1940, so it just missed it by six weeks. Wow. And that was because they stopped Pinocchio and they started over because uh, they didn't like how uh, some you of the characters me. looked. Okay. Oh, I thought this was uh, like the story was too dark or something. Or... Well, no, they, they well <laughs> lightened it up as they went. When they did Pinocchio, he uh, had all the animators do story and they all did their own section and it, there was so much stuff they adapted from the book it took two days to go through all the storyboards oh my gosh and so walt had to pick and choose what he was going to use in the final film and it only took two days <laughs> that's what they, they say but i i think it probably took a little longer mm -hmm. but there was a lot they developed for it that wasn't in there some of the scenes that are in there they were a lot longer i mean they, they had a scene with that you actually saw uh geppetto get swallowed by the whale and they cut that out they didn't need it wow and uh, I mean, I really think Pinocchio is probably the finest one of all the hand drawn films because of just how lavish they put everything into that. Okay. All and right. Because they had to start cutting corners after that because it was the films weren't successful after Snow White because of the World War II and all that. Right, right. Uh, Freddie Moore, is that who's next? Yep, we can do Freddie Moore next. Okay. So Freddie Moore, he uh, was hired by Walt right out of high school. He had no formal art training and oh, wow. he, he was trained by Les Clark, who was trained by Al Works. So this is how they all kind of moved on moved everything down paid it forward and he became the first skilled animator and he was just a little guy they always come in oh he was a little guy like a i don't know how tall he was but he was real like a fauci kind of little guy <laughs> i don't know <laughs> oh i love i just love seeing him looking in the mirror like that you know? uh, the nine old men looked up to him <clears throat> and uh he he kind of replaced our buyers. technically they technically looked up to him yeah technically <laughs> i mean they, they really respected him even though I mean, that's uh, Ward Kimball with him. They're working on Dumbo there. Because the stork, you know, leaves Dumbo. Yeah. And that's why I guess they're wearing the the um, nursemaid uh, hats. The baby uh, thing. Yeah, that's funny. <laughs> and he was he was known around the studio. He did, uh, he drew a girly art. They were known as uh, Freddie Moore girls. And some of the faces of the, that kind of, uh, that's him with his wife, his second wife. Uh, first wife they got divorced uh the freddie moore girls ended up in that's a caricature of them uh yeah. the freddie moore girls would end up in some of the girl characters in the studio in the 1940s you'll recognize them because some of them are in here okay. um he, oh, wow. yeah, he did the three little pigs that was really the first time there was ever a character animation like that where you had personality and notice the wall there the father is a sausage Oh, bro, I didn't and, even see And some that. of the other shorts, they have as a football. Oh, no. The pigskin. Uh, that's funny. And that's from one of the South American shorts there. That's just concept art. And these are what the Freddie Moore girls were like, but you you recognize them from some of the, the shorts and everything. That one's from a short. And that's from, that's one of the ones that's uh, the, the hat, that's the one that's the Martins and the Coys, Parody Hatfields and McCoys, and that one's a band short because of the guns. And that's from the uh, another Latin American short. He's the guy that redesigned Mickey Mouse for the Sorcerer's Apprentice. Mm. So he went from the pie eye to what we know today as Mickey. He designed the Seven Dwarfs. 
He did Lampwick in, in uh, Pinocchio, and that's supposed to be a, a caricature of him. Uh, he did Timothy Mouse. And uh, we all, that's, that's how he wanted to design Snow White. They, they kept the dwarves and everything in his style, but they didn't go with his version of Snow White. That's the storyboard of Lampwick. And that's how he looked in the film, but that's supposed to be a caricature of Freddie Moore. Yeah, I can see that in the other one for now, sure. Now, some people think it was a caricature of Mickey Rooney. <laughs> they put a little bit of Mickey Rooney in there with the acting. Now, that's a caricature of uh, Ward Kimball and Freddie Moore. And that's in the short called The Nifty 90s. <laughs> and they're vaudeville performers. Because... Uh, uh, Freddie Moore was an alcoholic, and uh, Ward Kimball would often cover for him and do the animation and give him the credit, so he would still get paid. Wow, bro. And he ended up getting fired in uh, 1946 because he was an alcoholic, and he went to work for uh, Walter Lance and Woody Woodpecker for a few years. He redesigned Woody Woodpecker. He worked on uh, the Puppetoons with the, the stop motion. Then he came back to Disney in 1948, and he just worked with Ward Kimball, and they did the mice and uh, Cinderella, uh, Cinderella the White Rabbit, the Lost Boys, and and uh, Peter Pan, the Mermaids, and he died in 1952 of a car accident caused by his uh, second wife, and uh, he was only like 41, uh, 43, something like that when he died, and uh, he didn't he didn't uh, learn the things that the line old men learned, so he was kind of left behind in uh, animation, but you can see in those early films what his influence was. He made a lot of the discoveries that they built. They they stood on his shoulders with, and uh, he was just a pioneer of caricature character animation. That's from Fantasia. There, he's from one of the South American shorts. We can't have him now because he smokes a cigar. It's a Cuban <laughs> cigar. <laughs> oh, that's well. an that's an example of a Freddie Moore girl. That was Slewfoot Sue in uh, Pecos Bill. Willie the Giant. That's from Mickey and the Beanstalk. A lot of people don't realize Mickey and the Beanstalk. They started working on that around the time of Snow White, and they had to shelve it because of money, and then they came back to it later. It was going to be a feature-length film, and they made it into a, a featurette, a little package feature thing. And that's a 2008 on it is when they brought that well, back? Oh, well, no, no. They did that no. in 1947, okay. I think. Okay, I was just trying to figure out what that... 2008 was referencing oh, it's it's probably just the name that was on the file because okay, i got yeah. that one online right. i didn't have time to scan a lot of uh, stuff this week because i did a lot of research <laughs> <laughs> i see all right okay I, so... I scanned some but uh not as much as last week are we at uh, art babbitt now yeah now, art babbitt we'd mentioned before he was the guy that started the strike but this is what he did for walt he started 1932 and he was one of the highest paid animators at the studio but he was an extreme leftist and he developed goofy as a character. And uh, we have a picture of there in the folder somewhere. It's the, when we get to it, but what goofy originally looked like. And then, yeah, that's what he looked like in the beginning. He was known as dippy dog. And he, he always referred to him as the goof. And he said, goofy was someone who never really knew how stupid he was. He <laughs> thought, he thought long, hard and carefully before he did anything. And then he still did it wrong. Gosh. Yeah. <laughs> and he, I don't uh, know, but thought... the greatest the greatest Disney cartoon sound ever is Goofy f falling off the side of a mountain or something. Yeah, 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 hoo hoo wee, <laughs> and, it, it, and it's always in all of the shorts. Some of the features even have it. it. Even some of the new features. I don't know about the CGI ones, but in the '90s they were still using that sound effect in some of the live action or the animated features. It's in the Hunchback of Notre Dame. So good. He also said of Goofy, he thinks as Goofy is a composite of everlasting optimism, a gullible good Samaritan, a half-wit, a shiftless, good-natured, he said, colored boy. So that tells you what he thinks of him. Mm -hmm. of, uh, he's a leftist. He said he was a hick. And uh, he said Goofy's brain is rather vapory. Boy, that quote better not get out or they're going to cancel Goofy. Well, Art Babbitt's the one that did it, and Art Babbitt did the strike, so I guess they would have to be uh, conflicted on... Uh... Mm -hmm. It's always it's always the leftists that say things like this. I and, know, man. And I didn't realize that was in there until I read it. <laughs> oh, gosh. Well, I speed read when I... But that was what he actually said about Goofy, so yeah, that's his wow. own words. We don't edit history here. Right. 
and what some of the characters he did, he, he, he did the queen in Snow White, Geppetto, the dancing mushrooms in Fantasia, the Greek gods in Fantasia. He met, and we have a photo of her. He married uh, Marge Belcher, who was the live action reference for Snow White, but they got divorced within two years. And uh, he's the one that orchestrated the stu studio strike. Then he, he ended up leaving because of how he was treated after that. He co-founded UPA Studios with the other people that started the strike. Later on, he trained Richard Williams, who uh, went on to do Roger Rabbit. And that was what really started animation over again for the, our generation. And uh, he did a lot of the uh, Roger Rabbit generated interest in the Looney Tunes as well. So it's, it's that film that really brought animation back again like it was in the 1930s. But that's who Art Babbitt was. <laughs> Okay. Well, and Walt did not uh, like Art Babbitt after the strike. I mean, he never, they never reconciled, never. That's was the live action model for Snow White. Oh, interesting. And that's, that's Art Babbitt as an old man with Richard Williams. And Richard Williams passed away a few years ago. So that would have been in the seventies, probably. Richard Williams. Uh, tell us who that is. Well, he did uh, the, that movie that took 30 years, the thief and the cobbler. He did Roger okay. rabbit. Uh, he did uh, Ziggy's gift was a Christmas special. Wow. What he would do is he would uh, do a lot of work for commercials and he would take the money for the commercials and put it into the thief and the cobbler movie and just bang the commercial out really quickly. Hmm. And that's how he made the, this went on for the 30 years making this film. And he, uh, after the, he lost thief and the cobbler, he just kind of left the industry because he was just so uh, hurt by that. And that was because it took too long to get the film done. How do you pronounce this next one? Uh, Vladimir Taitla. Wow, that is. Uh... He was best friends with Art Babbitt, and he was he also was involved with uh, orchestrating the studio strike. But before that, he started in 1934 at the studio. He worked on the animated shorts. He got Walt's attention. He was one of the top paid animators. He did uh, very uh, forceful characters like Stromboli and Pinocchio. That's what he's doing there. Um, he designed the dwarves with Freddie Moore. He did Chernabog and Night on Bald Mountain in Fantasia. He did the wizard in Fantasia the, with the Mickey Mouse, the Sorcerer's Apprentice. That's yet his name was Yen Sid, is what that was Disney backwards. And we have a photo of him coming up. Uh -huh. But th this is where he was doing the uh, Chernabog and Night on Bald Mountain. And they said Walt didn't realize how uh, powerful of a character he was getting when uh, he put him on it. In the press at the time, they tried to claim that they based the look on Bella Lugosi, but it was based on another animator. And uh, he paid some of his assistants out of his own pocket. And uh, when they went on strike, he said he was for a union. And he went on strike because the people on strike were his friends, but he was sympathetic uh, to Walt. And he didn't want to do anything against Walt. And after the strike, he left. And he, he uh, worked on some of the World War II shorts. Then he left, and then he... Uh, Worked at the New York studios for other other studios. They, they that I just love looking at these drawings. You see the yeah, power in them, cool, everything. Man. Yeah, mm -hmm. they are cool. You can see why some of the uh, animators felt the inkers never got the same uh, power in the inking. Just the drawings just look so different from what the final film looked looked like. Eek. Some creepy stuff. Well, Good we didn't we didn't get to it in an early show. We will later, but uh, I think Chernabog is who's running Disney right now. <laughs> Man, there's the, the elephants in Pinocchio. He did some of uh, Dumbo as a child. There, that's Yen Sid. Hmm. D Disney backwards. Mm-hmm. He specialized in scenes with the seven dwarfs where they were in a group. Okay. That's why I had that example. All right. Uh, next on the list, we have... Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, ben, ben Sharpstein. Sharpstein. Couple of yeah, pictures I don't have much to say on him, but I wanted to put him in there because he's the guy that actually directed the first few animated features. Oh, wow. Okay. There's not a lot about who he was or anything, but uh, he stayed with Walt until uh, the 50s there. And then he retired. Uh, Walt directed only one short, and, and that's him getting an award with Roy. 
And that's called a mouseker. They would give that to the employees when they would retire. And it's a Mickey Mouse statue, but it's like an Oscar, but it's the mouseker. <laughs> mouseker. I like uh, that. I like Well, that. I'd only ever directed one cartoon. It was a short, silly symphony. It was the Golden Touch, and he never directed again after that. So he must not have liked doing the day to day directing. He oh. just served as the producer after that. And uh, is this person's name just the letter T? Yeah, T? that's what he was known as T. He. T. He. And he was very eccentric. <laughs> I'm guessing so with a name yeah. like T. That's his first name, just the letter it, T. H. E. E. His real name was Thornton He. And he worked in Looney Tunes in the beginning, and then he came to Disney, and he worked from 37 to 46. He was real tall, and he weighed 300 pounds. Okay. And, uh, his wife made his own clothes, <laughs> and uh, the, he, he was just very eccentric, and his wife would take him places and say, isn't he pretty? <laughs> <laughs> and that, that's, a, that's a drawing by uh, Bill Pete we'll get to later. In his autobiography, Bill Pete won't mention it by name, but he calls him Mr. T. Okay. And this is, he did caricatures, and these are from one of the Silly Symphonies. They're, that one's uh, Catherine uh, Hepburn. The other one was, uh, uh, I can't think of his name now, W.C. Fields and Charlie McCarthy. Ooh, what uh, do we got here? What's going now, on? He now, came, he came back in the, in the 50s and did stop motion. And this is from a short they did on Noah's Ark that was about 20 minutes long. What takes longer, hand drawing an hour's it, worth? It or depends. Because Stop motion, you have to do it straight ahead and move frame by frame. But right. with hand drawn animation, you kind of you you go through and do the uh, the key frames, and then you just keep adding more and more frames to get your timing till you have what you want. Hmm. And th th in the forties, when they he was there, uh, T he had a little red car, <laughs> and people people thought it was hilarious watching him getting out in and out of this car. And they were the March of Time was there to film a video a film about the studio. And Walt told him, make sure you get him climbing in and out of his car because it's just so funny. <laughs> and uh, that, that he did the opening credits for the parent trap. Mm. And uh, Walt and him had a falling out in the 40s because T. He went on Steve Allen show. That was like the Tonight Show of the time. Mm -hmm. and he took a lot of credit for working on Pinocchio. He did the fox and the cat, like planning the scenes. And Walt chewed him out because he he uh, Walt didn't like his employees getting a lot more credit than he did. Oh, boy. And uh, T. He also wrote for Bob Hope, and he worked at other studios. He did Puppetoons. He worked at UPA. Um, he wanted Walt well, wanted him to do a. a that's with uh, uh, Joe uh, Ramp. He trained Joe Ramp at college. He taught college there. He lost a lot of weight there at the time. Mm. Uh, T. He uh, Walt wanted T. He to do a, a film about Baron Munchausen with uh, the stop motion. He refused to do it, so. Walt fired him again, <laughs> and uh, oh, he no. wanted to put him in Mag Imagineering, but he wouldn't go into Imagineering, and he ended up going to teaching. He taught at the school Walt set up, that uh, Cal Arts, and that's where he met Joe Ramfney, mentored a lot of these guys, and he died in the 80s. He had Alzheimer's. Uh, so I see Joe Grant is next. Yeah, and, we, and we've talked a little bit about him before, but this is about his days when he worked for Walt. He started in 1932 when Walt saw some of his caricatures in the newspaper and he hired him to do celebrity caricatures in his Silly Symphonies. Because back then, a lot of the shorts, no matter what studio, they would do caricatures of, of the celebrities of the time. Mm. And that's what he looked like when he was that he came back in the 90s. And uh, his father had been a, a newspaper illustrator and that's where he learned how to do it. The Reluctant Dragon. And you that's a good see name. it. See if that is on uh, Disney Plus because this it's a, like a film about the studio Walt built after Snow White, and they have some of the shorts in it. That, uh, that like uh, Baby Weems is in there, the Electric Dragon short. Some of the people we'll talk about they're actually in the film. I'm gonna check uh, right now. In the opening credits, they have caricatures of a lot of the animators, and those were all drawn by T. He. And uh, I have to get back to you because that's, that's okay. that was like fun. <laughs> the reluctant it's, dragon. It's, it's a live action film, but it's got some shorts in it because this was one of the first package features. And okay. When they did the when they did the reluctant dragon, he had a belly button, and the Hayes office made them go back and redo the whole thing without the belly what? button. Oh gosh, scandalous! What? What was the reason? Well, at the time, yeah, you couldn't have a belly button in a. Is it a, a male or a female dragon? It's a male dragon, but people okay. today try to say he's gay because he's eccentric, but. <laughs> 
Did. Ward, Ward Kimball did a lot of yeah, the animation. Yeah, it's on there. On that. 1941. Okay. <laughs> that was made in the midst of the studio strike. That was the film they picketed. Mm. And uh, Joe Grant got on the wrong foot with a lot of the uh, animators because uh, they would say his, his uh, caricatures were unworkable in animation. He socialized with uh, Walt's family. And some of the the first uh, play the first place Walt heard about things from like Winnie the Pooh and Mary Poppins is because Joe Grant's wife introduced Walt's daughters to those characters and those stories. He designed the the witch and the queen in uh, Snow White because oh. Walt hired him to stay as a story guy, and uh, he was the first uh, Walt was the first studio with a story department because a lot of the other studios they just made up silly things as they went in the shorts, but because Walt was going to get into features, he needed to have a story department and Joe Grant ran the story department and uh, he teamed uh, first he teamed Joe Grant with a guy named Bill Cottrell and they did a few shorts together and they developed Snow White and then after that uh, he was teamed up with a guy named Dick Humor and a lot of people didn't like Joe Grant Ward Kimball hated Joe Grant till the day he died and Joe Grant's the one that was behind doing figurines of the characters to help the animators yeah, they, they still do that to this day, but this was the first time those were done was for Pinocchio. I was just about to ask you that because as I'm seeing these, I'm imagining them sitting on the desk like we've yep. seen some pictures already. Yep. And I would imagine that if multiple animators are drawing the same character, are they having to pass? Well, the, they would make the, duplicates. Dupli yeah, okay, fine. Um, but but then the, the, you, you read my mind, honestly, Ed. Yeah, they still do this practice today, huh? With hand drawn films, they do. They, they okay. not so much with CGI. They'll make the they'll, they'll uh, digital they'll that uh, 3D print. They'll 3D print the models to make those for uh, publicity, but they don't use them to to do anything with for CGI. But so uh, cool. they were making those right on through when uh, Disney shut down the hand drawn studio, hmm. and a lot of those, you know, still survive. There, there's the and like that there. How do you do a whale? Because they couldn't have filmed a whale. For right. Snow right. White, so you can see how they ha that's on a gimbal to do the angles and everything, and what it would look like in different perspectives. And people don't realize how much work this stuff was back then, yeah. the, in the pre-digital days. And what they did with that wagon and the also Stromboli's wagons in here too, they actually filmed that, and they uh, that's what you see in the film in the in the final film. They made relief cells with it. They didn't that's... actually draw the wagon. That and is it, wild. And they even made models of the cuckoo clocks in Geppetto's shop so they could see how they would work. Uh. That's these would be these would come out of his model department too. They would just be uh, character character design ideas and things and concepts. I guess that one's in there twice. That's for a deleted sequence where uh, Pinocchio gets told a story by Geppetto about a father tree, and it looks like Geppetto. And, uh, hey, buddy. <laughs> Joe, Joe Grant uh, was the person behind Lady and the Tramp, even though it was finished after he left. Um, he uh, he hired a lot of puppeteers to work for him, and that's how they got into doing these statues of the characters. <laughs> I mean, that's from Fantasia, too. That's Bacchus. I think some of those must have been shot for uh, publicity photos, though. Mm-hmm. But he, he developed a lot of the films, did Snow White, uh, Pinocchio, Fantasia. He developed Dumbo from the, a book he would give. Uh, they would feed Walt pieces of it every day to get him interested. And that's how they ended up making Dumbo. And uh, in, the, in the original story, Dumbo had a bird friend and they invented Timothy Mouse. Because that was because elephants, had. there's that legend, they're afraid of mice. Right. That was a Joe Grant idea. And he was still doing ideas like that into the 90s. And uh, they, this is baby what, weems. This is what, in the, what's this story about? Ed? It's in the Reluctant Dragon. Okay. It's about a baby who uh, who's born a genius, and all of the world goes to him for uh, all of their solutions to all their problems. And you'll see that in some of these. It's told in storyboard form, but Joe Grant wanted to make it as a feature length animated feature film. You know, and they they didn't do that. <laughs> But, but you, I don't know what it is about this reluctant dragon, but I'm into it, you know? <laughs> yeah, I haven't seen it in a long time, but it's really interesting. You remember it. I remember seeing it for the first time in high school. Oh, is that, that Einstein? Yeah, that's Einstein. He, he's teaching them the, the theory of relativity. 
Hang on, I gotta write this. Oh, he's <laughs> well. That's what that is. He, uh -huh, you yep. remember I, Einstein was still alive at the time. <laughs> that's awesome. I, I'm making a reminder here to go and see that. It's only like an hour and ten minutes, something like that. It's not a very long film. Good stuff. What else is in here? <laughs> I think that's Sigmund Freud, but I'm not positive. Okay. Is it a bathtub or a bassinet? <laughs> I think he's in a bassinet. The, and the whole what the whole story is about all the the world wants to be around the baby, and that's the merchandising. Today that would probably be some kind of weird fetish. <laughs> <laughs> He's there playing well, chess with playing multiple, elements. multiple. And this, okay, that's Freud. See, that's Einstein, and then to the left is Freud. I, I don't, I, I don't, don't know, know there. Um, uh, I don't know who's, but just smart the, people. <laughs> the parents wanted to be with the baby, and then they couldn't because the world wanted to be around the baby because he was smart. So that the whole story is about how the parents get back with the baby, and the, the ending of the story is no, he, don't ruin it for <laughs> me, bro. <laughs> Go well, ahead. It's only to... been up for 70 years. Well, probably years. a little longer. Yeah. yeah. Well, the, the, he gets the baby gets sick and then he wakes up. He's no longer a genius. He's just a normal baby, and the parents are thrilled. Ed just ruined it for us, y'all. <laughs> okay. Well, first of all, who among us? <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh wow. So there, there they are making they the mer they merchandise baby weems. He was a popular character at the time, and I bet. people don't even know who he is now. And that's one of the sculptures you could have bought at the time. Wow. That was during World War One. There's an article about Joe Grant there. Oh. Now, dur during the studio strike, Art Babbitt, who was also Jewish, he was anti-Semitic to towards Joe Grant. So mm. I don't understand that because they're both Jewish. How can one be anti-Semitic and the other? That's but that's in all the histories. And Grant didn't like Babbitt's leftist politics. And that's why, I mean, they, they there was one story where Art Babbitt had someone paint Jude on his car, and this is during World War II with Hitler doing that to the Jewish people in Germany. And and this I mean, was Babbitt was the anti-Semite. Yeah, and he's Jewish. They were both Jewish. So don't get that. I don't either, but mm. that's it's in the studio history. That's from Lady and the Tramp. There, the original version. Um, he did uh, a bongo. Now this is from when he was in, there in the nineties. They brought him when he come back. They. He got he bothered a lot of people because he would just walk into their offices and he did a short about a cat with a tail that was alive. This one here is about dead pets. Huh. They they were just having him. And this is from a Bug's Life. Look who the bakery is for the cookies. Uh -huh. Casey Junior cookies because Casey Junior was in Dumbo, and Joe Grant was the bakery. How cool! That's from Pocahontas. He was when they did the talking animal version. He was the one that was really the champion of that. And they, when did Joe Grant die? He died in uh, 2005, I think. It was the same wow. year that uh, Joe Ramp died. They both died. Now that's some of the ideas he had for Hercules and the Hunchback that aren't in the film. But that's from one of the books. Lorenzo's the cat with a live tail was going to be done for a third Fantasia movie and. They didn't make the movie because Roy got fired, so they just put him out as shorts, what they had made for the movie. And it was nominated for an Oscar, but it didn't win. How he got how he came back to Disney was uh they were trying to figure out how things were done when Walt was alive. And and they interviewed Jack Kinney, who was a director. We'll talk about another day, but he he was having uh, Alzheimer problems and Joe Grant was around they were still friends and he came and sat while he was there and you wouldn't even know he joe grant was in his 80s at the time when this happened and people thought he was like 50 because oh. he was just so he was so sharp till the end of his life wow. and uh <clears throat> he the reason he left in the first place was because he's the one that brought alice in wonderland to disney and uh walt got kind of frustrated with uh, that story and it it failed and the, it didn't make money it wiped out all the profits from cinderella so he left and he founded a ceramic greeting card business with his wife. They would just do art. And they did that for 40 years. Then his wife died. Then he got involved back with Disney. And he came back and, and uh, saw what they were working on. And uh, eventually they, the people would keep going to him. Now, that's the guy who did the desk there that you brought up. But I'll get to him in a little bit. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. You would take him off? Yeah, I'm almost to him. Okay. But... Uh, I'm with putting Joe, Kim Weaver back on the yeah, shelf. That's okay. Joe Joe Grant would um, get into fights with the Jeffrey Katzenberg, you know, that we've mentioned before. 
And but then when Katzenberg left, he wanted Joe Grant to go with him, and Grant wouldn't go because all these people they were still loyal to Walt, even though Walt had been long gone. Mm -hmm. you know? And uh, he, we, some of the things that Grant did in the '90s, it was his idea to give Aladdin a boo for a sidekick, the monkey sidekick. <laughs> um. He's the one, he's the reason why Grandmother Willow is in Pocahontas the Tree. Uh huh. Excuse me. Jeffy Katzenberg was going to cut her out. And what he did was he told his storyboard partner to uh, Joe Grant, did he told him, all, give her all these corny jokes about my bark's worse than my bite <laughs> and things like that. And uh, the guy's like, oh, they're not going to like this. And this is stupid. But he'll do it anyway for Joe Grant. And he did it. And she stayed in the film. Uh, he put the cricket in Mulan. And he was oh. also the guy that came up with the title Monsters Incorporated because the Pixar guys would go to him for advice as well because you you had this guy that was there for all those years. And a lot of the directors and things, they didn't like Joe Grant because he would just walk into their offices. This old guy would just walk in the offices and stuff. So they started giving him busy work to do uh, so they he wouldn't bother them anymore. But they had no intention of making these films. And one of the films he wanted to make was Mr. Popper's Penguins. He wanted to do that way back when Walt was alive. And uh, he did like 10 or 12 different ideas that they were going to do the pitch meeting for. And they do the big meeting and uh, they won't make any of them. And he kind of told them off the 90 year old guy telling off the management. And he called them all uh, the wall. That's what he would call the management. But uh, then when he died, they all acted like he was their best friend because you'll read interviews about him. And they all like praise Joe Grant and how they advocated everything he did and all this stuff. And it wasn't like that at all. Wow. It's weird. But uh, he also said he never realized what a genius uh, Walt was until after he died. And he was one of the most influential people at the studio and defended Walt for uh, when people would say Walt was anti-Semitic because he was Jewish and he's, you know, he was in charge of all the story. So how much, you know, Walt put all these Jewish people in positions that were influential right. with what he did. He's no anti-Semite. And that came from, once again, Art Babbitt. <laughs> he was the source and the strike. <clears throat> so now you get to Ken Weber. I don't have a lot to say about him, but he's the one that designed all of the architecture and the desks and everything at Disney. Hmm. And that's just a photo of what he looked like. And a lot of these desks they still use to this day when they were doing hand-drawn animation. Oh, I like all those drawers on that desk well, there. Oh, and, I like that, that little inlet on the side, too. And, and those those drawers were so they could put their, their stack of drawings for the finished scenes there. Because oh. sometimes they'd have to go back and rework them. Man, I like that. I, I, mean, I really like that desk. I'm kind of hung up on it. There's there's a whole book <laughs> just about the desks and things he designed for Walt Disney. Oh, wow. And he was he was involved in the architecture of that second studio. I mean, in oh. that clock, it makes you think of Groundhog Day. I love but, that uh, clock. Oh, yeah. my goodness. Oh, he, my goodness. The light the, inside the desk there. That's that's how they were. The de That's how all the desks were, even into the 90s and today. And he was the one that really designed all that to be uh, functional like that. Yeah. I don't know if he's officially a Disney legend, but he should be because that influenced the whole uh, industry. You know, I'm having a flashback to my own childhood here because my dad... Uh was a surveyor and i remember he had a desk kind of like that with the light in it and everything and mm -hmm. that's that's super cool man look at that oh uh, gosh i would love to have a desk like that myself no but... kidding and i've seen some of them where they have the computer equipment on the desk for uh doing the like the pixar films and all that right right they want to they want to have that for the studio history the ones that cared, I don't know if they care now, but it, these photos go back, you know, the last 20 years or so. That was his drawing, designing that desk. That is that, cool. And that was one that was auctioned off. Yeah. That, like, that's how it would have worked. They would have put the model sheet on the, the little door there. And, I see the cordless phone on the left side there, the drawings yeah. for Mrs. Pot on the yep. left. How awesome is that? They were still using those discs until 2003 when uh, Disney threw everything away because they shut the animation studio down and then they had everybody come back for Princess and the Frog. And a lot oh. of the animators had bought their desk from the studio. Uh, yeah, I can understand. Wow, that's really cool stuff right there, man. Mm. That's why I, I thought he should be included because that, 
it's just an important part of the industry there. And uh, I believe up next is Mary Blair. Yeah, and she's so important. Everyone imitates her today. And uh, she was from the Midwest as well, and like a lot of these people were. And her family was really poor, but they went without food to give her art lessons. Wow. And she married another artist named Lee Blair, and but they sharpened each other's skills. And they they her uh, his brother was Preston Blair, who wrote one of the first animation books. Have you ever seen the one with the dancing elephant on the cover? Okay, that was that's Preston Blair. So it's like a very a talented family. But she she married into it, and uh, she had poor eyesight, and she wore multiple pairs of glasses plus contact lenses, and she was colorblind. But her film work she did is the most colorful. You'll you'll see here. It's she incredible. Went, and none she, of these pictures, though, does she have glasses on? She, I think she might have been with some of the later ones. And that's okay. her and her husband at a party. I think they're dressed as uh, Indians or tribal people or something. <laughs> okay. But uh, she uh, worked with her husband at MGM and the Up Work Studio as well. And she came in 1940 because Lee got her a job there because she did Small World. That's what that's a photo of. Yeah. Recognize um, those dolls for sure. Her husband said that Joe Barbera made a pass at her, so he got her a job at Disney because his brother worked at Disney. And then he came to work at Disney. And uh, her start was really they went on a trip to Latin America to uh, when during the strike. They had to get walled out of the country to get away from the studio because he was going to have a nervous breakdown again. Mm -hmm. And uh, FDR offered him a trip to go down to South America to make movies, you know, research for movies because they were afraid... Uh, the Nazis were going to, to get a foothold in South America. And that's why he made the Saludos Amigos and the Three Caballeros. There was going to be a third one, but they didn't make the third one. But it was in Orson Welles was making films down there, too. But they didn't get done either. So let, let, let me pause for a second here, because you mentioned something that I'm very intrigued by. But I'm just trying to, to figure out exactly what you mean. So FDR offered to send Walt to South America to make movies because the Nazis were possibly going to get a foothold down there. Yeah. What what was the intention behind FDR? Like well, FDR was hoping that Walt would make like uh, pro-America connections down yeah, there. Yeah, that's what they were hoping would happen and the the Disney characters were real, were the most popular characters down in South America. Uh-huh. They went to all the different countries and there's, there's books written about their trip down there because this was the early days of air travel and how complicated that was. So they would have to pump the plane full of cold air before they would go up in the air because oh. the, the sun would make the plane hot because there, oh. there wasn't really air conditioning at the time. Yeah. You know, people don't think about this stuff. Mm -hmm. And this is from a deleted uh, scene in uh, Johnny Appleseed that I'd mentioned before. The Indians burned down a settler's cabin. And Johnny Appleseed confronts them with just his Bible and tells them to uh, uh, love your brother and neighbor and all that. And the Indians put down their weapons because anyone that would just confront them like that must have a powerful God behind them. And the reason it wasn't animated was because they didn't have money. They were cutting corners for this whole time in the late 40s. It's on one of the children LPs with the actual cast and everything. And I got told that by experts that it was never intended for animation, but why would she have done uh, artwork for it if it wasn't done for animation? Because she didn't have anything to do with the, the record albums. I think that one looks like your uh, guy you had on a couple weeks ago, the January 6th guy. <laughs> <laughs> now That's I'm drawing funny. blank on his name, but... Oh, Steve Baker. Yeah, that looks like Steve Baker. I see it. I see yeah. it, yeah. Reporter for the show Blaze. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think it looked like him. I noticed that no, when I... No, oh. you're onto something there. That's funny. Uh. But she, she ended up going on the South America trip with her husband, and uh, she invited herself. Well, thought it was a great idea, and that's where she l figured out this style. And that She never did that before then. And you rec you can see this style in the animated shorts, the color and everything, mm -hmm. and the, the, those post-war shorts. That's from Song of the South. I made sure we put a lot of Song of the South stuff in here. Because that's the missing hole in all these Disney films. Yeah, explain that. Because you were telling me before we got started here off the air, you were telling me about how each story would build on every, to the yeah, next one. Everything, every film built on the previous film. And Song of the South being missing, it leaves a hole there. On, I don't in the think progression. many people realize that, Ed. 
Well, even even the things that Walt did later, uh, like Disneyland and television, those were all built on the animated films as well. Everything he learned, it just kept getting building and building. Because Mary Poppins uses everything that he learned. It has the animatronics in there. It's live action. It has animation uh, in the story and the music and everything. Everything Walt learned was in Mary Poppins. That's why it's considered the definitive Walt Disney movie. Okay. But and and uh, before that, it was probably Song of the South. Uh, and that was the first time anyone combined the characters with live actors yeah at that extent and just you just see all that beautiful artwork they did and there'll so, never be a uh art of the song of the south book but these are in some of the books from the 90s because the, it wasn't considered uh something you purchase from society at that time and the people that worked on it were still alive and they knew that they weren't doing this to be racist right and we will, the next one we'll get to with bill pete he did a lot of stuff for song of the south we'll have um, she uh, Walt sent her to Georgia to do uh, research for Song of the South, where she did some of those paintings. Hmm. And what is this here? That's just from one of the family Christmas cards. Okay. And that's from uh, the Legend of Sleepy Hollow. Mm -hmm. And that was originally going to be in a Washington Irving feature length film, but they packaged it with Mr. Toad. And she, she thought outside of the box because, like, things like uh, they did so dear with, to my heart, she thought that the color should look like uh, quilts because of the time and place that the film was and people were getting into quilt making. I don't have any examples of that one, but uh, she also did Cinderella, Alice in Wonderland, and Peter Pan, and those ones really look like her style with the colors. Many of the animators didn't like her style because they thought it was hard to adapt, but uh, Mark Davis, who's one of the nine old men, he said she was the greatest colorist who ever lived. Walt was a strong advocate for her. And um, she influenced everything right up through Sleeping Beauty. A lot of the animators would bash her because she was a woman. That's what they would say. The, at the time, they called her Marijuana Mary or Marijuana Blair because of the way her design work looked. Um, <laughs> now, some believe her husband was jealous of her talent and her closeness to Walt. And he, Both of them were alcoholics. They both became alcoholics, Mary Blair and Lee Blair. And she left Disney in the uh, late 40s, but still worked remotely so she could focus on her kids. And she worked in the business with her husband. He ran a television animation studio. Huh. And she also designed theater sets, greeting cards, ads, illustrated books. And she did uh, the sets for stage shows at Radio City Music Hall. Oh, wow. Um, and especially was painting children. And that was from the Latin America trip. And... Uh, and that's why Walt had her come in to do It's a Small World for the New York, New York World's Fair. And that was the biggest job she ever did. Now, this is some of the people imitating her today. They imitate her style for animated films. And a lot of the CGI films imitate her style. Now, that's from Alice. That's genuinely Mary Blair. And uh, she, she uh, worked on murals and things at the parks. But then after Walt died, people came in and they tore out the, the murals because they were jealous of Mary Blair. And uh, when uh, Walt died, she was devastated and she praised Walt as a family man because he accommodated her to be a mother with her kids because she worked. She lived in New York and he still would let her work on the feature films. Wow. He sounds like a terrible boss. To well, I know. I know. Allow her to work remotely before it was even a thing. Yeah, <laughs> that, that's what. And then when this was written in the history books, it wasn't even a thing like it is today. Mm. There were a lot of female animators that worked there that Walt doesn't get credit for. We'll talk about on future shows. But uh, in the in the 50s, her husband got sober, but she became more of a, an alcoholic. And uh, she uh, lost her uh, ability to do this because mm -hmm. of the, her. one of her sons got involved in drugs in college. And that's what really devastated her. And her best friends at the studio were Mark Davis and his wife, Alice, and they realized she couldn't draw, and they wondered what happened. They found out it was because the son got this way, and, and it, it was just really sad. And, yeah. uh, and, and uh, she also, but before that happened, and she couldn't work anymore, she also did the, this is on uh, Tubi. It's a film called How to See, Succeed at Business Without Even Trying. It's a musical. And it's directed by David Swift, who was another Disney alumnus. He worked for Ward Kimball, but he also did Pollyanna and The Parent Trap for Walt in the live action. And he directed this film that's about a little uh, Weasley guy who works his way up to a company, he starts in the mailroom, and he ends uh -huh. up running the company within a week. <laughs> and it, it's a real funny satire. But, okay. it's, but Mary Blair did all the design work for that. 
Wow. Recognize the Peter Pan stuff. Yeah, see, so you you can you can see the influence on the the final film. Mm-hmm. And that one I think is from uh, uh, Alice in Wonderland. Yeah. That's oh, from Small World. Definitely, <laughs> it's got that Small World feel to it. <clears throat> yeah, sorry, some of these are small. This one was this show was a big one to put together. <laughs> no, you're great, man. You're great. I, I know we're not gonna get to everyone today, but we're ready for when we do in a future one. That's from a uh, uh, hundred one Dalmatians, I think. I think that's Cruella Deville, but I might be wrong. Hmm. It might be uh, from Cinderella. And that's I was gonna say. I think that might be the evil I, stepmother. I, yeah, because I see the cat sitting there. Yeah, but it's a striped cat. Oh yeah, fair. Yeah, that's okay. a small world. That is definitely from Small World. There's just something so unique about That's one of the imitators. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oops. Oh, wow. I guess you can even do AI imitating her, but I, I prefer her style to what these other people are doing. Mm-hmm. You, you go see uh, the little golden books in the store, and a lot of them imitate her style. Yeah, good point. Yeah. But see, I'm sure a lot of you have seen those books, but you didn't know who Mary Blair was. Right. Exactly. And see, there's another case. People say, well, it's a sexist. Look at what her influence was on all of his films in the post-war period. Now, this next folder seems to be very, very large for Bill Pete. Yeah, Bill Pete was a storyboard artist. That's why it's large. Okay. Uh, we just go right through it there. Go right Bill through. Pete was... He was the only storyboard artist Walt trusted to do the whole film by himself. And wow. he did he did uh, 101 Dalmatians, uh, The Sword and the Stone, and the first version of The Jungle Book all by himself. And uh, this is his story. He was raised by his mother and grandmother. His dad abandoned the family. He was a traveling salesman, but he returned after 10 years of being missing. And then he, he blew the family fortune, and then he ended up uh, assassinating himself, killing himself, suiciding himself, oh. the, the dad. And that this one, this is an interesting photo. This is on the back of his autobiography that was done for children. They're all holding cigarettes. <laughs> and that, that's Walt Disney, Bill Pete, and the other guy is Walt Pfeiffer, who is Walt's childhood best friend, who also worked for Walt. But if you remember a few shows ago, we showed that photo where Walt was dressed up like Lincoln, and there was a boy next to him dressed like Lincoln. That was Walt Pfeiffer. Okay. Interesting. So <clears throat> Bill Pete got a job at Disney in 1937. Uh, he changed his name. His He was born name was Bill Pete, but he changed it to Pete because he got tired of people associating his name with urination, you know, with all of the. <laughs> all the Must have been a rough childhood. Well, he said he didn't want his kids to grow up that way. And you know how they, it was a frat boy kind of thing at Disney. Mm-hmm. So he, he started out as an in-betweener at Disney doing Donald Duck shorts, and he kind of had a nervous breakdown. He, he left for the day screaming, no more ducks. He came back <laughs> the next day to pick up his jacket. <laughs> Look at how no Dumbo looks ducks. like a little boy in the in the tub there. Yeah, that's cute. <laughs> uh, he came back to get his jacket because it was the only one he did, and he found it. He got promoted to the story department, and he worked on, on Pinocchio first for a deleted sequence called Bogeyland. And that became Pleasure Island. Hmm. And he worked on he worked on Fantasia, but it was Dumbo where he really stood out. And uh, T. He would uh, take credit for his work and pitch it to Walt. And that's why he didn't like Mr. T. That's what he called him in his biography, Mr. T. Hmm. Um, he joined the strike against the <clears throat> studio, and uh, Walt downgraded him to a lower status because of that. But then he did uh, he worked on the feature. Victory through air power, where he and we had the storyboards in this where he blew up uh, New York City, had the Nazis mm-hmm. blow up New York City, and it didn't get put in the film. And he was never more thankful something to get put in a film in his life. And uh, after that, Walt put him on Song of the South, which was a, a pet project for for Walt. And uh, that's where, where it really uh, shaped together Song of the South was those storyboards. He uh, He's credited with why those animated sequences were so great uh, in Song of the South. And that was his that was his career highlight Song of the South and it's been erased. And he did a few shorts. He did the one if you ever seen Susie the little blue coupe with the little car and that all the cars in the Pixar movie they have uh, eyes on their windshield because of that short cuz Bill Pete put the eyes in the windshield instead of in the headlights. And just look how appealing this stuff is, the Song of the yeah. South stuff. 
He did the short, the little house, Lambert, the sheepish lion, uh, Goliath the second, Ben and me. What's the truth about Mother Goose, which I shared this week on Twitter. Uh, Ollie Johnson said that his storyboards were just so easy to uh, simulate the animation. They just inspired everybody. Mark uh, Davis praised him. Uh, Ward Kimball thought that Walt Disney was jealous of Bill Pete, and that's for the Tar Baby sequence there. Yeah. And that I do not believe the Tar Baby was supposed to be a black person. It was like a scarecrow. You go mm. right back into the stories, the original print stories, that's what it was. Uh, in a lot of ways, I think that Bill Pete was the successor to Joe Grant, because Joe Grant was in charge of story before Bill Pete. And after Grant left, Bill Pete was put in charge of the stories. Um, he uh, worked on Sleeping Beauty, and uh, he did the romantic scene with uh, the prince and everything. Sorry, those are small. Uh, that's from What's the Truth About Mother Goose there. Uh, very catchy song there. Uh, on Saving Beauty, he did the romance scene. Walt didn't like how he storyboarded it. And uh, Bill Pete always said it, he always did the best way possible and he wouldn't change it. So uh, Walt put him in the department that did TV commercials for Peter, Peter Pan Peanut Butter. So Bill Pete decided he was going to do children's books as a backup plan eventually leave Disney. And uh, Saving Beauty went on for nine years, and that's why Walt said we, we got to make these cheaper. So we put him on charge of doing the scripts for, for the next films. And on uh, Sword in the Stone, mm -hmm. Merlin, Merlin's based on Walt. He made him look like Walt, and he gave him Walt's uh, personality. Because Walt, be, Walt could be magical but argumentative. And that's from, <laughs> that's from the, uh, they had the uh, Wizard's Duel. Now, I also, one of the books I looked at this week, it gives credit to who said you can't make a personality out of a chicken for uh, Sh Shanna Claire and Renard. And they say Bill Pete's the one that said that. And the a animator, Milk Call, almost got into a fist fight with him over this. And he said he could design a very fine rooster. And then uh, Bill Pete said so could he. And by the and way. Uh, Danny K makes a, a good point to remind us in the chat there to go and vote for Song of the South for the Library yep. of Congress National well, Film Registry so we can force Disney. I love your plan, Ed. Force Disney to acknowledge this. I don't this know what's going to happen if they, if they do it. I don't know if they'll accept the award or if, uh, the gatekeepers in the Library of Congress will accept yeah. it. And, and and you see, uh, let's see, there's Ed's uh, handle uh, on Twitter. If you want to go and find it uh, later on, uh, maybe, Ed, you could repost that link yep. with, with, with the instructions because there are instructions. You need yeah. to know the, the year of the film, 1946, and you need to say a few things about it, like why it, should be, why, on the... why it should be on there. And I think I think just provide bullet points that people can copy and paste right there, at and, real underscore Ed underscore McCray later. And la last year's what films got on there from Disney uh, Lady and the Tramp got on there, and I think Song of the South is a better film, more important film than Lady and the Tramp. And The Nightmare Before Christmas got on there, and also from Fox, Home Alone. <laughs> so, if you put those kind of films on there, Song of the South should be on there just because James Baskett's the first black actor to get an award for yeah. acting, and it put was for all, that put, film. And, and put all these bullet yep. points, uh, later and, and just copy and paste them, y'all. Yep, and, and let's make this happen. And you have to, what, is it August 15th, I think, is the deadline? Yeah, that's the deadline. You guys got <clears throat> Foreigner nominated for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, so let's get this one. This is our, our second one here for all the pad heads. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I, I wish it would get traction in other places, too, because this this could really happen. We've got the time to get it nominated. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now, when he, when, uh, Walt, when he had a falling out with Walt, it was over the Jungle Book, because they did a darker version of the Jungle Book, oh. and he wouldn't change it. And uh, at the last time at the meeting where uh, Bill Pete saw Walt, Walt said to him, if you want to see real entertainment, go see Mary Poppins. And that was the last thing Walt ever said to him. And some of the animators tried to ease the tension between them, but it wouldn't happen. And uh, Bill Pete left the studio and he just focused on children's books after that. And when Walt knew he was dying, he wrote Pete a letter and made an offer to make animated shorts out of some of the films and of the books. And Bill Pete took offense to it. And he didn't respond out of spite, and Walt died. And oh. but but Pete still wondered afterwards that uh, he would catch himself wondering what Walt would think of some of the stories that he did. He did over uh, forty children's books and all. And uh, he died in two thousand two. And one of them is his autobiography, and it's worth getting if you if you have kids, 
I grew up with this book. It was it came out when I was in fourth grade, and I have a, we'll have a photo of it and showing up here when we get to it. Oh, but okay, okay. You then just look at big. you just look at this book. They have the the people smoking in it and everything. It's it's his autobiography. What it was like. And you'd never see that. This war, a book won an award. It won one of those uh, cold out awards, whatever they're called. And what's uh, the name of it again? It's called Bill Pete and Autobiography. I think it's still in print. It's not like a so highly sought okay. after book. But I remember when uh, it was in our school library and the, the librarian was, he'd run down Bill Pete. And he's like, well, for some reason he thought he was interesting enough to have an autobiography. But I thought it was interesting. And that, that was probably the first person I got interested in that worked for Walt, you know, you, you got to know that uh, people worked with him and what they did and everything. And he illustrates this book all the way through. Um, I mean, you think of that, the that's interesting. Book, that's interesting. So I mean, if we're much... learning, if we're learning Ed's story, if we're learning your story about how you really got in interested in, I mean, this, this was one of the books that got me interested in it. That's really cool. Um, yeah, because I mean, I'm I'm thinking about some things that I really like that are kind of hobbies of mine today, and I think, oh yeah, I remember checking out that book, and there was, a, you know, uh, anyway. So it's just uh, school libraries uh, have a, a major influence on kids, which is why it's such a battleground today for their souls, yeah. really. Now that's from um, when he, he blew up in New York City, but this is why before. why did he do that? It was going to be in that movie Victory Through Air Power that we talked about a few weeks ago, but. This is before Planet of the Apes. And look what he did to the Statue of Liberty. And this would have been about 20 years before Planet of the Apes. Oh. And this was to encourage people to, to, to support the war effort or what? Yeah, it was so they could support the flying in the in the, okay. the war. But this this illustration here, this is supposed to be when he first saw Walt. And then the next one is when he, he, he saw him for the last time. Oh, oh, no. Come on now. That's rough. Well, yeah. <laughs> They had a love-hate relationship, and that's yeah, an illustration from the book for Uncle Oops. Remus. Sorry, yeah. well, that's from the autobiography, and they even had the tar baby in there nobody cared 30 years ago. Mm. This is the, how what I mean about smoking. This is all through the book. I didn't even scan all the illustrations. It shows how they were at the studio <laughs> smoking, because uh, now you're not uh, even allowed to have photos of this. Wow. Man. I mean, you just think of what that place smelled like. Yeah, it's it's uh, not a shock as to how they all seem to, or a lot of them seem to die young. And uh, well, there's Walt there. He would he would always sit forward, uh, looking at uh, the storyboards like that with his smoking. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Here's your book, uh, right? Yeah, that's that's the book. That one's got the award on it. So I must have an edition before it got the award. Okay. I got the I got my copy when I was in college. Okay. <laughs> Now, I wanted to point out here that that's Bill Pete in the 80s, but look at all the kids there, all yep. different races. Nobody mm -hmm. cared about race. No one cared he was an old white guy. They just loved his <laughs> stories. Well, I mean, this is what they, they, they bring I out. Know. All these. They, I know. At Amazon, you can buy books now on what race someone is, what gender they are, what sexuality. And, and <laughs> they, they didn't care about that back then. I mean, there are a lot of black no. kids, a lot of Hispanic kids. They just so like I, history. I see 11 other photos that are outside a folder. Are we going to go through those well, here? I, I think uh, we did. They were the studio. Oh, no, we did. Yeah, I'm sorry. I had to refresh there. That's oh, okay. Wow. Look at you, man. The, the wow. next one's the nine old men folder. Oh, 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 oh. Okay. Well, you had to go out and then go into that one. Gotcha. All right. There's my only, bad. And I, we're we're I high tech we're not, here. That's okay. We're I know we're not going to get through all the nine old men, but we'll get through as many as we can, and we'll we'll do a part two, or I'll work them into other shows. But we'll get to them all eventually because I re this is this was the most researched show I've done because I don't know all their biographies off the top of my head, and not all of them you can find easily. The nine old men won't call them the nine old men because FDR called the Supreme Court the nine old men, but he didn't like the nine old men. This FDR, but Walt did it in a kidding way. And most of these guys grew up in the Midwest. They shared the same uh, ideals, same values, and they rose through the ranks through the time we were just talking about to become the top animators. They su supplanted a lot of the ones that we talked about before. Bill Pete worked with them, and so did Mary Blair. Um, and they were responsible for most of the films that Walt made in the, in, up through when he died. 
Uh, so I'm, gave... I'm looking here real quick. Uh, so I've got the uh, 217 Disney Legends Animation Studio. So is this? Um, I, I just nine, I'm not finding the nine, nine old men. It's called Nine Old Men. Okay. I can, you you see it there? No, I'm I'm checking here. I'm just not you, finding it, man. Sorry. It's, it's folder two. Folder two. Okay. Uh, hmm. I don't know, man. Sorry. Um, you can keep talking, and I'll I'll keep looking here. I know you put a lot of work into this, so I don't what? want you to be without it. I'm just not I'm just not finding it here. Well, here I'll, I'll email <laughs> it to you real quick. You want to do that? Okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah, I see. Uh, I see folder one animation studio. I'm just not seeing another. Is there is there another one after uh, nine old men, like a folder uh, three? Yeah, there's a folder three, but we're not going to do that one today. Okay. Huh. I have folder. I don't know why I'm not seeing. I, I just emailed you the link. All right, I'll be looking for it here. Um, fire right away, man. Why don't you spam folder? Um, yeah, we're good. So uh, <clears throat> they were. Oh yeah, with... here we go. Now I got okay. it. They were. Les Clark. With... Yep, he's the first one. Well, the not, well, first go to all the photos of them to, as a group. There, they're just all the loose photos. Okay. Um, Stand by. I got to get it back in a thumbnail version. All right. So it. nine old men. So these it, remind us who the nine old men were again. They they're the main animators of all of Walt Disney's films uh, from the post war on, and after Walt died, they kept things going. Uh, they were very loyal to Walt. That's all of them in the seventies there. <laughs> Um, and they weren't nine old men. They weren't old when Walt called them that. They were the nine young men. That's in 101 Dalmatians. They, like I told you about Pinocchio with the wagons, they did that with the cars. They were they filmed those, and that's what you see for the. It was pre CGI. That's uh, yes. a fake fight between the director and Bill Pete. There is what that's supposed to be. <laughs> wow. That, I mean, that's... they they had to have just. It, it just sounds like such an intense. But rewarding place to work. And see that how we we talk about how uh, a lot of this stuff that's happened with Disney reflects how America's declined. You, a lot of people that read about American history, they think about the founders as all being on the same page and not as individuals that didn't always get along. That's kind of mm -hmm. what the nine old men were like. Now these are stills mm -hmm. actually from the Reluctant Dragon. Oh, see, wow. that's that's in the drawing uh, room, and there's a lot of women there drawing. Mm -hmm. and Walt doesn't get credit for that. But uh, wow. they, what the nine old men did is they're the ones that trained everything they learned to the next generation of uh, animators. So they learned all this stuff and invented it themselves. But uh, they made sure that they knew that the, it would die with them if they didn't pass it on. So they passed it on. So the first one is Les Clark. He was the Les first Clark. one. He's the first of the nine old men that was hired. He got hired right out of high school. Um, he was from the Midwest as well. All of them were. Uh, he worked in an ice cream uh, parlor that was near the studio where Walt and Roy would come for lunch. And uh, when he, and this was when he was in high school and when he was getting to be where he was going to graduate, he uh, asked Walt for a job and Walt told him to bring uh, his art samples over to the studio. And Walt hired him and told him it was, was going to only be a temporary job. And he stayed there for almost 50 years. <laughs> Wow, and he was trained by Ub Iwerks, you know. The, so that, that that's how it all gets passed on. That's when they were old men there in the '60s. Les Clark with Walt. He worked in the ink and paint department. So when when Ub left, he took over for Mickey Mouse. He did the band concert short. You, I think I've got a still of it in there somewhere, but you'll know the costume when you see it. He did the short, The Goddess of Spring, that was one of the first experiments animating a, a human. Uh, character they were doing that so they would get used to snow white now that character there is uh, mortimer because they put him in one of the shorts and he's supposed to be a, car a caricature of walt is a mouse oh and, and we'll, we'll talk about mortimer and in a future show that's from okay. the country cousin the, the city mouse the country mouse um les clark was known as the mickey mouse master because he was the one that really refined mickey and was always in charge of him for most of the time he was there um he was the only one of the nine old men that always attended the free art lessons that Walt provided. And all through the Great Depression, he supported his parents and siblings. And he got his father a job as the guard, the gate at the guard. He got his sister a job at the ink and paint department. And he was always so thankful that Walt changed the life of the whole family. I mean, the whole family was thankful as well. Uh, and I have a practical joke that he play, he would play on new hires. 
that one there's from the band concert by the way mm -hmm. uh, people would say to, when they would have a new hire come in they'd say be careful of less he sees uh he goes berserk when he's swatting invisible pigeons so he'd be there drawing at this board then he would just swat you know pigeons away that weren't there <laughs> and then after after three days of doing this, he would just like go nuts and just get, run up screaming, and the the other the, the victim would uh, freak out because they thought he was crazy. And, uh, <laughs> nice hazing, huh? Yeah, well, that's uh, what the animators were like. Um, yeah, frat house. <laughs> yeah, it really was. And that, but the, you look at it, all the studios were like that, and now when they've gone woke, they're not like that anymore. And some of the p people have told me they think it's because they let women into the animation departments, but there were women working in some of these animation departments back then. They just were, I call, I say broads, like you go to the movies, the old movies, where they, <laughs> there'd be the woman that would kind of be kind of manly. Not not in a bad way, like Lauren Bacall. She was a broad. One of the boys, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> one of the boys. It, it, yeah, I, I don't think, I think broad is one of the highest, highest compliments you can give a woman these days, yeah. you know? Okay. It, everyone's just so woke now. Are you familiar with um, the TV show Mad Men? I've heard of Be it, and I know what because it Because it, it feels like uh, how Peggy was, uh, you yeah. know? Uh, she it's probably would have been a broad. The other guys. Yeah. <laughs> that movie I mentioned, How to Succeed in Business Without Even Trying That, Mad Men is based on that movie. And they had the actor come back to be in that uh, show. Hold on. Is... Mad Men is based on which movie? Uh, How to su Succeed in Business Without Even Trying. It's, is that right? It's inspired <laughs> by it. It's by... But it's like a... Bewitched yeah. was inspired by two movies. And uh, I Dream of Genie was inspired by a movie called The Brass Bottle. Okay. Be Bewitched was inspired by a Bell Book Candle and then uh, I Married a Witch. They both came out in the 40s. I think, oh, I right. think Bell Book Candle was in the 50s. It had Jimmy Stewart in it. I like it. Okay. Now, Les Clark was known as a workhorse because he, he would always get difficult scenes. And he did the scenes that no one wanted or the scenes that were left. And he had a very kind personality. Um, the shorts are what really showcases sp skills. But you saw some of the things he worked on there with the live action films. He became a director in the late uh, 50s. He was he was asked in the 40s, but he declined. He did a lot of the uh, educational films. The last film he did for Disney before he retired was uh, he did a film about the Loch Ness Monster. And it's on YouTube. We'll link to it. It's an animated film. But it's like a they animated Nessie in it, but there's documentary stuff with live action. Like they took it seriously. Hmm. It was called Man Monsters and Mis Mysteries. And the reason he, he retired in the 70s is because he heard an executive say that they wanted to fire everyone at the studio that was over 35, and he didn't like that. Oh, I wow. think he was the first to die, but I'm not sure. It might have been a different one. He, he mm. was either the first or second. Or he was the second one to die. Okay. But that's what got the nine old men to start training the next generation because some of their friends retired or died. I mean, a stupid question. There's none of the nine old men are still around today. Right? No, the last one that passed away was Ollie Johnston, and that was around 2008, I think. Okay. And I, but I wow. did find out this week, uh, prepping. Uh, he owned a full size locomotive in his backyard. It would run. Ward Kimball owned three. So this isn't. We'll get into that another time. But uh, <laughs> ep, I guess an episode of Jay Leno's Garage. They have Ollie Johnston's train. No, oh wow! Have to, I'll cool have to see that? if I can find that. But uh, all right, it, well here's. Are we up to Wooly? We have Wooly Reitherman. He was Wooly born Reitherman. in Germany, um, and he actually uh, lived two blocks away from the Disney's in Kansas City, but they never knew it until he worked at the studio. That's fascinating how stuff like that happens in history. Well, you know, that's like his Walt's well, mother <laughs> come from uh, where Disney World is today, the town of, or the Kissimmee, Florida. Mm. That's where that's where his dad met her, and uh, his dad is picking oranges there, and that's where they met. And now Disney World's there. Wow. Uh, he he graduated from Chenard. Chenard was the college that did the lessons for the Disney Studios, and he started in 1933. He took over Goofy when Art Babbitt left. He specialized in powerful characters at the studio, so that was kind of what uh, Bill Tytla did. That uh, Vladimir Tytla. He took over, and he was a swashbuckler kind of person in real life. He was a World War II fighter pilot. He was a pilot in his own uh, uh, personal life. And that was him in the 80s there, and he was known for wearing Hawaiian shirts, and I wonder if that's why John Lasseter does that. 
because Willie Reitherman took over directing all the animated features uh, from 101 Dalmatians on until the Fox and the Hound. Some of the things he did was the magic mirror and Snow White. And he got, mm. he was frustrated because they put a, an effect on it that made the uh, image have smoke and blur and everything. But he was very meticulous in how he acted with just a face. He worked on Timothy the Mouse. He did Monstro the Whale and Pinocchio with the chase. But he felt that got obstructed by special effects. He did the dinosaur fight in Fantasia. And what's interesting about this, and this goes into what your conspiracy shows, the, uh, the, the T-Rex had three claws back then because the experts believed they had three claws on their hand. And in the Carnegie Science Center in Pittsburgh, un until when I was a kid, they had a mural there where the T-Rex had three claws on its hand. And the, the conspiracy is the, they, uh, the experts claim they know everything. Now, here they had three claws in the hand for decades. But you go look at some of the people that claim that the ancient, ancient man saw dinosaurs. They knew they had two claws in the artwork. How did they get the anatomy right if they never saw it? Huh. Look at that. Huh. That's a Jiminy right. Cricket he's credited with. Okay. He animated the Headless Horseman scene in, in uh, Akabod Mr. Toad. That was also in Akabod Mr. Toad. That's the dance there. He worked on the White Rabbit, worked on the, the mice and taking the key up the stairs in Cinderella. He worked on the crocodile with Captain Hook. Mm. He, he did the dragon fight in uh, Sleeping Beauty. And everyone said he had a real strong sense of decency. Uh, one of the actresses that, uh, that did uh, Lady and Lady and the Tramp, she's also one of the fairies in Saving Beauty. She was in the hospital sick, and he sent flowers and said the whole studio did it. Uh, Lady and the Tramp, he did that fight with the rat. Mm. So he, be he became a director of all the feature films, starting with uh, 101 Dalmatians. Uh, he's the only person that ever directed a feature film all by himself. Uh, he had he always said he had boundless energy. He was able to keep track of what everyone else was doing. He always strived for the most entertaining uh, characters and stories. You don't hear that anymore either. Uh, all three of his sons have parts in the films. They were uh, King Arthur and the Sword and the Stone, Christopher Robin, Winnie the Pooh, and Mowgli in the Jungle Book. They did the voices. They did oh, the wow. live action reference too. Uh, I think on Christopher Robin, all three sons played that role. Because they did that over years. Uh, Walt and Roy warned him about the price going up because of Sleeping Beauty. So he always had to keep the price down. So he would, when some of these films in the 60s, you'll start to see they'll reuse animation from previous films. They'll just draw the character over it again. That's why this was done. He was the one that started that. The other animators didn't like that. And he retired after the Fox and the Hound because he got into a disagreement with some of the executives. But he was going to direct Catfish, Bend, and the Little Broomstick if they had made them. And he died in 1985 in a car accident. And that was the story of uh, Willie Reitherman. <laughs> mm. All right. We had, uh, it, John, John Lonsberry. Yeah, okay. Now, these, well, all three of these guys were very hard to get a biography on because there's very little written about them. Huh. And they always say he he's the most saintly of the nine old men. And he didn't like to get involved in disputes. His, his grandfather was a general in the Civil War who was known for his hot temper. So I don't know <laughs> if that's connected. Interesting. Um, his father had a heart attack when he was a boy. So income was always on his mind for keep taking care of the family. Mm -hmm. uh, he was an outdoorsman. He worked as a linesman in the pole setter for the railroad. And he was the one that would stand in the bottom of, of the while the guy went up the pole. He would stand there watching for rattlesnakes and shoot them because he was the best shot. Oh, look at that. There's there's one of those desks they auctioned off. Yep. yep. Very cool. And you can probably find out whose desk is whose because they probably all have serial numbers on them. Mm -hmm. um, he wanted to be a mountain man and trap game for a living, but he couldn't make money doing that, so he became an artist. Mm -hmm. Um his mother got him a scholarship, and that's how he got into art school. And he lived on shredded wheat for three years just to attend art school so he could afford art school. Mm. And, you know, you see the stuff with the college kids today complaining about things. They mm -hmm. don't, you know, they, they all go for their expensive lattes and all that. <laughs> There's old uh, Jack and the Beanstalk, huh? Yep, that's uh, Willie the Giant from Mickey and the Beanstalk. Mickey and the yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He, uh... <laughs> Another story story about his personal life. He met his wife in art school, and he she was asked out by another artist uh, once. And then John John Osbury 
at, kept dating her, and the other artist got offended, and never talked to her again. But then after John Lounsbury died, they had both been widowed, and they both ended up getting married. So that's just kind of a neat story. Uh, they all, and he'd worked at Disney as well. Mel Shaw was the name of the other artist. Oh, okay. Uh, so John Lounsbury, he worked on Snow White. He worked <clears throat> on uh, Gideon and Foul Fellow. Um, he it was he was the one that specialized in characters with strong personality and comedy sequences. He did the transformation of all the animals into uh, people in uh, Cinderella there, but he did them as animals as well. He did uh, the some of the stuff of the mice. Did Dumbo, Timothy, and Timothy the Mouse. He did the Wolf and Peter and the Wolf. He was the lead animator on the Rose and Alice in Wonderland, the Father and Peter Pan, uh, Tony and Joe and Lady and the Tramp, and he did the Elephants in the Jungle Book. And there's a review about those. That was the Italians there, uh, Tony and Joe. They had a review at the time of Lady and the Tramp. They said they looked so Italian you could smell them. And I don't know if that was supposed to be offensive or because it was an <laughs> okay. Italian restaurant, but wow uh now he he his house he didn't have a tv he they had a farm and he raised his kids up and this is in california so he raised his kids up they were in the 4-h they did hunting they collect he collected navajo rugs and historical items he never brought his work home with him he liked, liked to ski so walt would loan him his own ski cab cabin mm. and uh willie reitherman would pick on him but John Lounsbury would always say he would do anything for the good of the picture, you know, the good of the film. Uh, he was protective of his staff. He guided them with his suggestions. He wasn't hostile about it. Some of these guys were very hostile to their staff. He's the one that trained John, Don Bluth, and uh, Ron Miller wanted him to uh, be the director to take Wo Wooly Reitherman's place, but he passed away, and that's his story. <laughs> okay. The next All one right. should be... Milt, Milt Call should be the next one. I don't, know if that'll be our, I don't know if that'll be our last one today, but... Okay. Fire away, sir, on Milt uh, Call. Milt Call started up in the early 40s, 1934. He grew up... There's a mirror. He was a, <laughs> he was a self-made man. You'll hear uh, Brad Bird, who did The Incredibles, Ratatouille, and Iron Giant. He really looked up to Milt Call. Hmm. Uh, I always think of him, he's more like... You know how John Ford was, the director of the John Wayne movies? John you ever see any footage of John Ford? He's a lot like John Ford. Okay. Uh, he was a trout fisherman. He had a mouth like a drunken sailor. You know, he'd swear a lot, except in front of women. Then one mm. time a, pre a priest confronted him, so he didn't swear as much, but he still had a dirty mouth. Uh, <laughs> when he, you know, the, this is a frat boy thing. When they ask people in the studio to write down what their hobbies w were, he put uh, sexual intercourse. Oh, bro, come on now. <laughs> and then the next picture I go to is this guy. It's Dirty old man. Good. There we go. Uh, he was best friends with Mark Davis, who was one of the nine old men. He redesigned Pinocchio. And there's pictures of what, that's what Pinocchio was going to look like. They animated it for six months that way. And Walt said he didn't come up across sympathetic enough, enough. So they shut down everything they did for six months. And Milk Call redesigned him as a little boy. And he became the character designer because of things like that. Huh. And that's what really brought him to Walt's attention. Cause you see how much more appealing that is. He just decided to make him a little boy with the nose and put joints on him. But then it made it harder when Pinocchio becomes a real boy. He doesn't look as appealing as he did as a puppet. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was mostly cast as human characters cause he didn't need live action reference. And he was very good at animated performances and, some say he was the best animator of the nine old men. Uh, he was very boastful of his talents, bragged a lot, and he would often ignore the contributions of uh, others. He was married multiple times, by the way. So he, <laughs> um, so he was the character designer, but a lot of his designs you really see take root from Sleeping Beauty on. And mm. what he would do is he would animate a design for two minutes. They'd have to be in a two-minute scene before Walt would okay it. And he often incorporated Bill Pete's storyboards and Ken Anderson's story designs into the final shots of the, of the film. And no one wanted to animate Prince Charming, so he always got stuck doing that. And one time, Ward Kimball got him mad because he said, Walt always gives you the princes because no one wants to do all that boring stuff. <laughs> he, he had a temper. and People around the studio called him King Call or King Milt. He wow. was married at least three times, and he was one of the only people who would uh, be able to confront Walt 
one time Walt wanted to move uh, Ken Anderson onto Imagineering, and uh, Milt called him up on the phone and chewed him out, and uh, Walt backed down on it. But uh, when Walt died, he cried. He, you know, he was. This was like a, a man's man kind of a guy doing this animation stuff. I mean, I, I, just imagine what he would think of all these woke people in the animation today. Mm -hmm. He was very known for doing hands. That's why I got the hands there. He was very famous for hydro hands. Um, his second wife died of a suicide. She got a, a gun gunshot wound to the head, <sighs> and that just killed him because he bought her the gun to for protection. And she, I don't know. If, what the problems were, but his yeah, some dark stuff going on in these guys' lives. Well, yeah, and you just think of all the things that they did. You wouldn't think of it looking at these films that they had all these dark things in their lives. You just uh, you never know what people are going through, man. His his third wife was Walt's niece, and uh, she was she was his wife's niece, and she was called fun loving Phil because she was hard drinking, hard smoking. And when they got married, she he was her fourth husband, and she was his third wife. Okay. And she Sounds was perfect known, for each other. She was known as the call girl. They were married for about 10 years, but they were very competitive with the, each other, and they ended up getting divorced. <laughs> his, his fourth wife was a librarian. What? Yeah. That sounds just not what you expect. Well, they only were librarian. married for a little while, because she pa he passed away <laughs> in the 80s. Mm. He... he uh, didn't treat Les Clark or John Lousbury very well. He didn't get along with Ron Miller, and he ended up leaving Disney. And a lot of people lost respect for him because of the way he treated everybody. Because he, I don't know if he had was going senile or something in his old age, but he was very uh, hostile with a lot of the people that were his friends. The last character he did for Disney was Madame Medusa, and it was based on his ex-wife, the uh, one that was Walt's niece. But he always denied it, but everybody always said that that's uh, who it was based on. Now, sorry, some of these are small. He did Shere Khan in the uh, Jungle Book. I mean, to skip by that. Yeah, he's a good one right there. And that's how he, he got to be friends with, uh, oh, that, that guy I mentioned earlier. It's a lot of names <laughs> wow. to keep track of. No, brother, I don't know. The how one that directed do it. Roger. Now, that's what Tigger was going to look like before Milt Call redesigned him. Uh uh. Yeah. <laughs> I like the uh, I like the redesign then. Yeah, I, I put that's what Tigger looked like there. That's what I like, yeah. And he would have had a different voice with the old one. He would have been Wally Bogue. That's, oh, Madame, I see. that's Madame Medusa, but that's the voice actress of her. So you can see how the what the influence is. He wanted to... Uh, his best friend was Mark Davis, and Mark Davis did Cruella de Vil, and he wanted to top Mark Davis, and this is what his attempt was on that. So if you remember, they were Ken Anderson wanted to have Cruella de Vil be in The Rescuers, but Milk Call didn't want to animate Corella. He wanted to do his own character and compete with him. That's for Mary Poppins, the judges. That's the king in Sleeping Beauty, one of the kings. That's from the Sword in the Stone. That's from Bedknobs and Broomsticks. That's from the Aristocats. That's the butler, Edgar the butler. That's from the Aristocats, too, but I forget his name. He was the lawyer. That's from Robin Hood. Now, these are ones that he did for, uh, he did character designs for the Black Cauldron. So these were never in the film, but you can see he was still designing characters right through the end. This is from uh, Robin Hood. <laughs> That's in the movie. She drops a uh, a birdie down her, her shirt there. You know, the kind of birdie you hit with a, a tennis paddle. King Louis there, Madame Medusa, and he—he he was just a perfectionist on everything he did there. If you, you just skim through these here, these this is how they planned out their scenes when they would animate a scene. And that's why I have all these here. Uh, you, you can see how they would uh, rough it out and everything. There he is, she is with her sidekick there. They would do sketches like these to figure out what the actions would be. Those were called thumbnails. Mm -hmm. That's the actual <clears throat> animation. These are all from Andreas Dreja's uh, page there. He had a, a page thing about uh, all of the uh, training that they would do for the scene. I mean, I call it character training because you, you're like roughing out the scene, how they're going to act. 
Mm -hmm. Do you see how loose that is? And then they would go in and draw the final character over that. She's, she, I think she's climbing up a stool there because she sees the mice. That's what that is in the film. Those are the thumbnails where she's getting dressed for bed. Now, these are the rest of the Black Cauldron ones. Now, the Black Cauldron isn't that bad of a film, especially when you compare it to what they're making these days. <laughs> the reason they did the Black Cauldron, Walt bought the rights to those books because uh, they, they someone wanted him to do The Hobbit, and he couldn't get the rights to The Hobbit, so he did uh, the Black Cauldron, and that's how the rights got secured. But they, they spent like uh, 20 years developing this into a movie. And I don't know, I have the books, but I've never read them, but I don't know if it, uh, how close it is to uh, any of the stories of the books. Because they combined all five books into one movie. Man, that's got to be confusing. <laughs> and he did the animation on Professor Ludwig von Drake. Oh, yeah. Oops. He, oh. he was one of the guys that did that. It's got to be tough if, if multiple people are working on the same characters, you know? Well, that's why it was tough to uh, figure out who did what when they worked on the same character to show these uh, pictures. I bet. I bet. You have time to well, start this... Davis, or? Well, let's see. So, what? What? Where do you want to pick up next week? If we uh, pick well, up with week... Mark Davis. Well, no, next week we'll just do Disney, and we'll come back to okay. the other. Okay. So, people, but... yeah, let's do that. Let's let's save um, the rest of the um, the I nine. Think we have four or five left. I think we have four or five left, but. Yeah, it looks like uh, two, four, six. Because I had a lot of uh, animators we I took out of the show today because I knew I wouldn't get to them all. Oh, so we, yeah, so we'll five, five more of the nine old men, and then we've got even some other stuff here. So, so yeah, yeah we, we will definitely uh, come back to this. Because so. our original plan was I was going to work Floyd Norman in at the end, but we I know we couldn't get to that today. You just have too much information, bro. I mean, well, I'm telling you. I'm starting to panic because we only have five shows left. No. <laughs> No, no. Okay, I'm going to convince you, and maybe the audience can as well, convince you to make a... When we're done doing these 12 episodes, which, again, to remind everyone, we're doing these live streams uh, available on demand as soon as we're done here, but uh, live streams every Saturday morning at 11 a.m. Eastern through March 23rd. That'll be a total of 12 episodes. But then, and y'all are going to have to help convince Ed uh, and, and help me convince him to start, hit no pressure putting you on the spot, Ed, your own YouTube <laughs> channel, uh, something where you can constantly do this stuff. You are a walking, you're an uh, encyclopedia, right? You're an yeah, encyclopedia that's, that's, of knowledge. Yeah. So yeah, that's, that's what you are, Ed. And I, also... and I know that, and what's going to happen? I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. You're going <laughs> to get done with the 12 episodes, and then five minutes after the 12th episode, you're going to be like, oh, I should have done a whole episode on this, or oh, I should have oh, included like this. Yeah, so that's why you're going to start a YouTube channel. I don't know. I got I got <laughs> When I'm done with our 12, I'm going to finish uh, my Jill Chill book for the year. And then uh, ah, I got other to things that. I'm working on. So, Understood. <laughs> I, I, I totally get it. That's man. one totally reason it's it. hard to do a, on my own because I'm I'm doing my own things too. And yeah, I, Trust me. I yeah. get it, man. I get it. Okay, so uh, Ed McCray. Uh, so next week is going to be Disneyland. And then, I mean, the plan right now after that um, is uh, the animated uh, characters. I think we're animated going characters. Yeah, I can work uh, some of the people in on that too. Some of our animators. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. You'll figure it out. And then we got yeah. live action. We got a lot of stuff coming up here. So Ed McCray, thank you as always for making time. Uh, you obviously are going to send me uh, the stuff, uh, the description stuff, yeah, the stuff, and yeah. the links that that uh, that will provide that people can do uh, further research or or. Or look look into things that you've talked about here today. So uh, we really appreciate this, Ed. I mean, it just it's always a joy uh, to hang out with you uh, for these couple of hours every Saturday. So thanks for making time as always, man. Well, you're welcome. I'm, I'm glad right. this one. I wasn't worried this one wasn't going to be as entertaining because it's all these little biographies. <laughs> I just love I love seeing all these uh, all of these drawings and stuff and seeing the process that's involved here. Mm -hmm. So um, and anyhow, please. Yeah, those of you who have friends that have maybe um, uh, don't see the problem with what's going on with Disney and the company, or 
people that maybe they're oblivious, you know, or maybe, maybe you have other friends who have completely given up on Disney. And I can totally understand that. Share these episodes with them, show them the history and why it needs to be preserved. And maybe they will um, have a newfound respect for the company. That's totally worth saving uh, in spite of itself. Uh, courtesy of Ed and all and the great of, information he's giving us. A lot of conservatives us. don't think that animation is important, but you look at how they're using it to uh, change the culture and influence the culture. You said and, it, man. I'm used to being di uh, kind of discarded by conservatives because I do cartoons and things. And they don't think it's important, but I think it's one of the most important things you can do these days. And and you know what? I'm going to go ahead and um, tell you uh, at the end of the last episode... Uh, you just alluded to it. Be sure to uh, inform people of the stuff that you're working on, like Jill Chill and, and places where we can go to keep oh, up with what you're doing after just, this series is done, man. Just follow me on Twitter there. I'll put stuff on there, but I'm, I'm working on that. And I have my comic book with the American folklore and history and all that. And uh, I've been I love it. I've been away on that for a while, but I, all the stuff I know about Disney, I also know about American folklore because I'm the kind of person that just researches everything they can about whatever they're working with. You're awesome, man. You are trying <laughs> to save the Republic in so many ways, and we're so grateful for you, buddy. All right, Ed McRae, uh, we'll see you again here a, a week from today at 11 a.m. Eastern for Saving Disney History Part 8 with uh, Professor, Disney <laughs> Professor Ed McRae. And thanks, everybody, for joining us. We appreciate you. Bye-bye.